Welcome to the Town of Orange Town's Town Board meeting for September 17, 2019. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Estevan? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Would the town clerk please call the roll? Councilman Dennis Truman. Councilman Tom Diveny. Here. Councilman Paul Valentine. Here. Councilman Jerry Vitari. Here. Supervisor Chris Day. Here. Okay, a few announcements before we get going with our meeting, which has a couple of public hearings. Well, three, two of which will be continued, will be basically nothing be done, and then the other will be doing a lot of listening. Take this. Thank you, Esther. Right? Uh, town of Orange Town continues to have our farmers market. We're getting to fall, so there'll be some harvests showing up soon. That's on North William Street between Washington and Central Avenue in Pearl River. Uh, that continues through November 24th on Sundays from 10 to 3. Next to Tepan Players at the Barn, a local theater group which performs in the Mance Barn in Tepan is opening up this weekend. The production this year is a hysterical comedy titled 20th Century, and the shows are Saturdays, the 21st, 28th, and 5th of October at 8 p.m., and Sundays, the 22nd, 29th, and 6th of October at 3 p.m., coming up these next three weekends. General admission, only $18. Seniors and children under 12 are $10. On September 21st, 2019, the world through the United Nations will celebrate the International Day of Peace, and to commemorate that event, the Pearl River Rotary will unveil their first, the first ever peace poll in the town of Orangetown, which is at Veterans Memorial Park at 9 a.m. Friday, September 20th. On September 22nd, the 22nd Annual Orange Town Police Department's Open House, Chief Butterworth is proud to invite all in the town and outside of it to visit, see the cars, see the officers, see the jail cell and such, and there will be a wreath laying in honor of fallen officers at 1 p.m. in the main lobby by the police department. Saturday, September 28th is the 35th Annual Colonial Day in Tapan, over at the uh, DeWint grounds. The free admission, they include revolutionary reenactments, bagpipers, sheep shearing, cider making, all sorts of stuff like that. Children can go and do activities, as candle making, other things like that. Uh, goes on on Saturday, September 28th, most of the day, noon to 5 p.m. Public hearing, October 1st, for a proposed new set code section for community choice aggregation, which deals with what your default electrical provider is, we basically pull it back from the state to the town level to set the default and save us some money as residents. October 1st, 7.35 p.m. We'll be rescheduled to 7.35 p.m. It's right now at 8.05, but we're gonna bump everything up a little bit that night tonight. Uh, that same date, we'll be adopting or moving to adopt the unified solar permit for New York State to make it easier and more efficient for solar companies to install solar panels on private residences here in town. Also on the 1st of October, there's a proposal to modify our pack development zone with a lot and bulk controls. Uh, that is gonna be ending up at 7.45 p.m. on the 1st for the public hearing. And at October 1st, we'll be pushing, we have a continuation of a zone, zone change application for Ryerson Estates, 7.50 p.m. October 19th, there's a free paper shredding event at Orangetown Town Hall to be held by our town clerk, Rosanna Spraja. We will be accepting also non-perishable foods or cash donations for people to people. Uh, limit of three boxes per person. Come on down early, there was a long line last time we did it. Then on the public hearing on October 22nd, a one-year contract for 2020 for the Blauville Fire Protection District, followed by a one-year contract for the Orange Town, South Orange Town area libraries, Blauville, Orangeburg, Tephan, and Palisades on the 22nd. These are public hearings, sorry. And then finally, the public hearing on the 2020 preliminary budget on 1022 at 8.20 p.m. Uh, we also have one on the, that's the one, one second. That's the, and then the 12th of November is the final preliminary, but the final budget hearing. It says preliminary in this announcement, sorry. Uh, 12th, November 12th at 8 p.m. Um, and one, I think this is the final announcement. There's a lot today. Uh, there's a new worn and tattered flag collection box at the Camp Shanks Museum behind the Orangeburg Library. If you have a tattered old American flag, please bring it there. It'll be disposed of in a respectful manner. Was there one more announcement from the audience? Yes, Esther. Yes, Esther. Thank you for celebrating the 25th anniversary of Earth. Since 30, we've been recorded at Ventura, Arizona. Six in the evening till 11 at night. I ask that the board 
That's what date again? November 2nd. November 2nd. November 2nd is the 50th anniversary. I'm just repeating it for the, audio, the TV. Uh, November 2nd, 50th anniversary of Venture over at Venture Hall. All right, so next we have the uh, budget presentation. I'll be presenting the preliminary supervisor's budget to the town board. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just move over to the podium so I can address the board directly, and then we'll go on from there. Chris, do you need the uh, remote? I don't. This is all going to be just. Okay. All right, this, this microphone sounds louder. I don't know if it's because yeah. I'm out here with the speakers, but it does sound louder. Gentlemen of the town board, uh, this year's budget as I propose it, which is going to be handed out to you or sh should have in front of you already, from uh, Finance Director Jeff Bensick, who I want to thank for his time and effort. And I also want to thank all of our department heads for their work and trying to do their best to get these costs down for the people of the town. Uh, we were able to get under the tax cap again in the town of Orangetown. That's many years now in a row we've been able to do it. Last year we delivered a small tax cut. This year we were able to take a little leftover cap room from last year and the cap room from this year and make it under the tax cut cap. Uh, at this point, with this budget, this was a difficult budget. The fact is that every budget line, all the fat, if you will, the extra stuff that was left over at the end of the years, that's all trim. The budget lines are accurate pretty much to the dollar or we're just going over, just going under. We're basically out of easy things to cut. In this budget, we kind of get through the middle difficulty things to cut that we can that require a little work, and we start to kind of get to the extremely difficult choices that future town boards are going to have to make if some things don't change structurally in New York, in the county, in Orangetown, and in the community at large. These structural costs increasing and headwinds in the general economy are causing very intense budgetary pressure. We are able to make it work under the cap, but it's still a lot of pressure we're going to be dealing with and future boards will deal with. I just want to preface by saying a lot of people assume that the town board ta town taxes have something to do with Ramapo or Medicaid or tax fraud. Those don't have any impact on the town and school district budgets. We collect nearly every dollar of the tax levy each year thanks to the effort of town clerk Rosanna Sfreja. And we are reimbursed by the county for anything that isn't paid, and then they seize the properties after the fact. The average tax bill for a homeowner is 60% school district, 30% town, 10% county, and others. Of that 10%, only half of that is a Medicaid issue. None of that has anything to do with what we're dealing with here in Orange Town at our budget level, and other towns are dealing with outside of Ramapo. So what we need to focus on at this level is these structural costs and changes I'm about to list. Which mo a lot of which are passed down without any input by New York State or New York State's structure for us dealing with it is so restrictive as to make it very difficult for the towns to make any changes. Um, those other macro issues in the county going on in other areas, they don't have any effect on the town or school tax bill. So this year, we as a town basically aggregate each year a 4.5% growth in salary cost. Salaries themselves make up 80% of the budget. That 45 includes the 2 to 2.5% two pay raises per year in the contract and also the structured growth of time in grade, time in position that goes on with salaries increases. That is affected both by contracts that are negotiated, but more importantly that we have to deal with as a town is the structure by which the state allows us to negotiate contracts. Forced arbitration and binding arbitration for the police department and the fact that we have the Rockin County Police Act that limits the comparative points to towns that are nearby that all pay higher cause us to have a lot of difficulty in lowering down police costs. And the union costs on the other side also have a lot of structural issues that cause upward pressure on the costs. This year, we have projecting, a, we were told basically by the state, this is passed directly down, to be a 9.5% increase in retirement costs. We're predicting 8% increases each in workers' comp and risk insurance, 5% increases each in police life insurance, in dental costs for our town employees, and in other insurance costs. We're also seeing the effect of a changing economy nationwide. Interest rates, which were going up, and we luckily were able to take advantage of, well, they were, thanks to some renegotiated deals we made last year, are dropping at the Fed level. So we've reduced our estimates for interest income by 35%. Further, the housing market, which had been causing large building permit revenue to increase, is flattening nationwide and locally, and we're seeing a flattening off in total number of permits applied for at the town level. 
which can only allow us to have conservatively predict revenue, not predict further increases in, in uh, building permit revenue. On the good side, not so good for this budget, but good for going forward, this budget, the 2020 budget, is the last year of the IRG downward or shrinking pilot, so it won't be continuing to reduce our revenue. We've gone from 10% of our tax base on the commercial side being due to the former Pfizer property and now IRG. Now we're around, I think, 1%, Jeff. So this is now bottoming out on that end. And the other good news is that Chase is continuing to grow, though it's starting off slowly, it will continue to grow for several years going forward. That isn't enough to offset everything, of course, but it's a good, good trend as opposed to the other ones. Last year we cut a net, added one, took away one, to end up with a net of 13 positions reduced. This year we're cutting a net of eight positions in my proposed budget. All of these were made vacant in advance via retirement incentives and just coincidental retirements before these positions are being reduced. There are no layoffs and there were no layoffs last year projected. That's a 7% reduction in the full-time workforce in two years. So we are cutting as much as we can in a brief period of time to address these structural costs. This year, I've elected to put in increases for our elected official salaries. On my way out of office, I've realized a couple of things. One, I fortunately was able to have a second income coming in to allow me, my family to make ends meet with this level of salary. Not many people have that. And what we ran into when both parties were trying to find candidates is a lack of people seeking the office because as the lowest paid or one of the two lowest paid towns for all of our elected officials, some lowest, some second lowest, it's difficult to get people who don't already have a retirement income coming in or don't have some sort of second job which can distract them from doing their actual main job for the town. These proposals do not raise us to anywhere near the highest in the county. It brings us more in line, but still lower than Clarkstown, Ramapo, and Haverstraw in most cases, but gets us off the bottom of the barrel. In fact, some of them just bring us even. Uh, for example, the town clerk had been previously collecting a $20,000 stipend on top of her salary. That was inappropriate under guidelines for elected officials. Now we just put that back into the salary the way it was before. Jim Dean eventually, I'm sure, will retire, and I'd like people to actually want to be able to get paid appropriate level for the amount of work they do. So he, his increases, small increases for the town council to bring it more in line, and an increase for the town supervisor. I won't be taking that, I won't see any of that money, but I think it's important that we pay closer to what the going rate is for people who run a $70 million budget, 300 person employee organization. There are other proposed cuts in this budget. We're removing one clerk position each in town attorney, in assessor, in justice court, and in sewer and we're adding some part-time hours to compensate for the extra workload. I want to reiterate also that all of these costs being cut are substantially higher than the net increase of elected official salaries. They're also adding, an, there, was an, there was a new building inspector position added out of the budget season last year. Uh, that, that, this budget eliminates a code enforcer position, which results in a net change of zero for the, for the uh, building department but shifts over to the more flexible building inspector position from code enforcers. Building inspectors are able to do code enforcement, but also issue and inspect for permits, whereas code enforcers cannot do that. So we're realigning our personnel in that direction and also adding some part-time hours to compensate for the extra workload. Two labor positions are being removed in highway, and we're adding an office position funded via other budget cuts, including in seasonal and part-time employees and other things throughout the budget lines. Jim did a good job of pulling through the budget to get that position and to be able to restore a potential cut in our leaf pickup, that's now back in. We were originally gonna to have to remove that. We're also removing three police officer positions, but we will retain the school resource officers that are partially funded by the high schools that we added in previously. One big one that goes to the difficult that the town board will have to wrestle with is the five of us, is I'm proposing closing the Broad Acres Golf Course, which right now loses between one and $250,000 per year and has millions of dollars in deferred capital projects because of the state of it when we got it from New York State. The golfers can then play on our 27 hole and better maintain Blue Hill course down the road, which adds to the bottom line there and turns a, a big loss into a bigger profit margin on that property. We also have additional capital projects coming up that are much needed and long delayed. The town hall, the community center. That means that I wanted to keep the fund balance spend at no higher than last year's level because we actually are using it. We can't count on one shots of revenue to not spend that fund balance. We need the cash on hand for these long-term projects. We've also only just begun to be start investing in non-golf recreational infrastructure like playgrounds. We opened the first new ones, the first newly updated ones since 1997 this year. 
our main large playground complex at Veterans deserves and is overdue in terms of how long the equipment's supposed to last for a complete, fully accessible replacement. And there are other smaller aging playgrounds that are past their lifespan, which leads to un potentially unsafe and certainly at least not pleasant conditions for residents and kids. Our residents also deserve a variety of recreational activities like the community center that was mentioned, a splash pad, a dog park, other amenities to go along with 27 holes of the finest and highest quality golf west of the Hudson over at Blue Hill. In order to allow for us to fairly allocate those scarce resources to all types of residents and to address costs, I personally believe we have to make hard choices like going from 36 town-owned holes of golf to 27. Going on to the sewer department, sewer is finally investing in much needed infrastructure and not relying on emergency repairs. They're getting ahead of problems and they're putting money into the system. Long delayed increases in sewer fees are, being hit, are hitting this year in order to allow for this change of management. It averages over the past, I think, eight or 10 years, it'll average about 3% increases. The levels have been kept approximately the same for the last eight years. The good news on that front, though, is that we had been anticipating this potential $40 million mandated expense to deal with the ammonia issue. All signs point to the fact that we will end up with a very, very substantially reduced cost for that in the level that will not have a significant impact on budgetary operations. The sewer department, for reference, does not affect the tax cap calculations. We're also investing in this budget in software that will further improve efficiency of employees and government, so allowing less people to do more in key departments and especially our building department. The new town hall, when built, will allow further consolidation. There's not much left at this point to cut in terms of personnel without starting to induce some trade-offs in services. The thing with the software is the software is a flat cost that allows more efficient government. It does not rise each year. If we can put money into software and make things more efficient, we could then run with less people as people retire. This is my last budget. Obviously, I'm leaving office. This fact is, and we've talked about this on the side, structural costs as set up in New York State for our towns will soon make hitting the tax cap all but impossible unless town boards and the public make hard choices that, and of course Albany fixes it, but let's be realistic, we're gonna have to deal with it without Albany fixing it, right? Town boards in the future and the unions are gonna have to cooperate, need to work together to try to get a renegotiation of our salary structures for new employees so that we keep the net increase, including annual raises and including steps in grade, to closer to 2% from 4.5%. That's very difficult to do with the current setup from New York State without buy-in from our unions. But the unions are going to have to realize that as we hit certain points, it's going to affect their employees' ability to get their job done and make their lives more difficult. And it's a trade-off between raising taxes to the point where they can no longer live in the town they work for or fixing things so that in the future it's more structurally sound. We also must continue, and future town boards need to continue, as you all have, to invest in labor-saving technologies that don't come with these cost increases and make this organization more efficient like businesses are doing in the private sector. For the public, and some people are starting to filter in for the, T the TOD meeting, I see. Just one note, for the average homeowner when this all nets out, if the value of our commercial tax base had stayed the same as it was in 2018, your tax bill as an average homeowner would have gone up about 1.44% per year. But because of the trends in the business community in Rockland, the trends nationally that are affecting retail, the value is dropping relative to home values. So that the base proportion, the proportion of taxes that gets laid on commercial versus residential is shifting more and more to residential. And that's a calculation that's outside of our budget process. So the average homeowner instead is going to have an average over the last two years of a 3.16 net impact on their bottom line of their tax bill, even though our budgets have not gone up that much. What that means is that though the town board has already very smartly passed a law that sets a band and a limit on how much that shift can occur in a given year, it's still shifting continually. What that means is that we have to be open to having commercial development to take on more base for our taxes. If we keep things frozen as they are, taxes will inevitably go up even if future boards are able to keep costs equal. It will continue to shift on the resident and continue to drive people out of their homes. So basically what that means is that in order to preserve our town and keep it somewhere we can afford to live and where our kids can afford to live, we do need to grow the tax base in some manner. Otherwise, every homeowner will keep automatically, through no effort of the town board, picking up a larger share of a tax bill without more rateables to spread it over. We need to be able to say yes to things that are good 
and bring needed tax revenue economic growth instead of saying no to everything. Or, and here's what the alternative is, we said no to everything, only the bad things will be available when the time comes. Fire sales to cash buyers, kids continuing to move away due to spiraling tax hikes, and a shrinking tax base will be in our future. If all we say is no now to things that we think are okay but not great, because this, we want to keep the town exactly frozen in stasis the way it is, we will guarantee that the town will eventually collapse as anything that gets stagnant does. A pond that has no movement becomes a swamp. It will collapse into something we would never want it to be and that our kids will not be able to leave in. And the only thing then we'll be able to say yes to, finally, is to whoever shows up with enough cash to save the equity we have in our homes because no one else wants to aff can afford to live in a town that's that overtaxed. We saw it happen in Chestnut Ridge. It can happen here. In order to preserve Orangetown, we must also grow, adapt, and remain vibrant and thriving and adapt to the future while keeping the core and the community that makes us special. As I said, this is my last set buffer budget. It's required much effort and focus to get these last two budgets to where they are, and I'm proud to have tackled these challenges head on. I'm not seeking re-election. I'm simply trying to put the next supervisor in town boards going forward and our town at large in the best possible position to deal with these continued negative trends of rising mandated costs and shifts to the residential taxpayer so that our town can remain prosperous and happy. So members of the board, I therefore formally submit the budget you have in front of you for the 2020 calendar year and look forward to continuing to discuss it with you as we go through the public hearing process. Thank you. Moving on, we now have the uh, agenda. We're going to be workshopping to go through what's on the agenda items, and then we'll be going back to start off. We have plenty of time before the hearing, which is scheduled for 825, so we may be able to finish the uh, actual the voting comment. process. Public comment will come after we do the workshopping of the things, and then yeah. we'll so we'll workshop. I think we'll go with the workshop. Remember, we're doing the both. We do workshop, okay. then we go back to public okay. comment. We changed the answer. Right. Yeah, it seemed like they did. All right, so first we're going to open the public hearing for the Route 303 zone change for Bieber. Uh, that's going to be delayed because they are not prepared to present tonight. We're looking to reschedule that for um, when was it? When we're going to reschedule that to? Send a request to October uh, 22nd. October 22nd will be when we schedule. That sounds right. Okay. All right. And then item number five. We, there was an issue with noticing of the Haran Place property maintenance hearing, so that is being moved to to the date of October 1st at 7.55 p.m. Uh, that's to deal with a, a property that has not been properly maintained, so unfortunately we have to bump that a couple weeks. Then number seven, we're going to be opening a public hearing on the TOD ordinance, which will begin with a presentation. I'll be going over the same one that was presented to us as a board before this hearing. Well, I'll be read off and present to the folks that are here. Then we'll be open for public comment on that subject. And then we'll be voting to continue. We're not going to be voting on the substance of the law at all tonight. We'll be discussing it only um, to continue to a, a date in the set to be, that we'll set at that point in the future. We'll then vote on the Provo Chamber of Commerce request for the alcohol beverages subject to state li liquor authority licensing requirements. This is the same thing we did last year. Um, we do need to appoint someone to the planning board. We have a bunch of applicants that I think we're going to consider for potential people that are on currently on ACABOR and people who have applied for planning board to do, but we need to probably sort it out by the next meeting, I think. It's probably realistic. I know Amanda sent out all the resumes today, I think. Um, so we'll get to that. That won't be voted on tonight because we don't have the full name set up. Then we're accepting the resignation of Chief Butterworth from the um, Office of Emergency Management Committee. He's remaining as chief. He's been gracious enough not to leave after being appointed a few weeks ago but he's not on the OEM committee anymore. But Captain Brown is stepping in to take over in that position on the OEM committee for item number 12. Also, Frederick Sims will be appointed to the OEM committee. He's the Rockland County Deputy Fire Coordinator. We're amending our calendar to change the time of the next meeting. We have a lot of hearings, so the police chief has also been gracious enough to allow us to bump out police commission and start earlier to get a head start on it. So all these next series of, a bit of motions we'll just bump everything up a half hour, essentially, for that date. So we have the public hearing rescheduled for community choice. We have the public hearing for the unified solar permit. 
We had the public hearing for the proposed change to the town code for lot and bulk controls on pack developments. And then we have the public hearing for Ryerson Estates on the corner of Greenbush and 303. Uh, then we will also, then we have resolutions number 19 we're on now to approve the license and use of town property for filming. This is something we all were, were told about in advance and happened already. Also again, filming at Tacomac North Park, that's $5,000 for Tacomac and $5,000 for Fifth Avenue and Blauvelt to our coffers, if you will. 21, we're authorizing funding for the Perva Chamber of Commerce downtown holiday lights. We bumped this in at the last second because they get a discount if they order by October 1st, so we're putting it up a little earlier than normal. Then we have a resolution to approve the same thing we did with the Pearl River School District. So some changes in state law required us to more specifically identify the fact that our SROs do not do uh, school discipline. So that's being added to our SRO agreement with South Orange Town, as it was with Pearl River last meeting. Then the DEC is saying that they're going to get on one of our properties and look around. They basically said either we agree to it or they're going to do it anyway. So we're going to just sign and agree with it because they're going to do it anyway. Then we're approving a retainer agreement with Keenan Bean to deal with an Article 78 filing. Aloof is suing us related to that. I don't want to talk too much about it because I'll get myself in trouble, I think. I don't. Well, it's Rob, public record. You describe it because I don't I'll know what I'm it. to say. It's public record, but it's uh, an Article 78 challenging the ZBA's uh, last determination um, about a month and a half ago. So um, recently we finished the prosecution. Um, of certain violations, alleged violations in the Justice Court, which is separate from this. But uh, this, there's an Article 78 proceeding, which again is public record. It's contained in there. But uh, we're asking Keen and Bean to step in because the town attorney's office, we've been very involved throughout the entirety of this thing. And it um, would be appropriate, we're asking to, uh, to bring Keen and Bean on and, and assist. They uh, also assisted us recently successfully in a lawsuit uh, involving uh, the police department and uh, so they do a good job, and we're hoping they come in and help us. And they rhyme, which is important. And they, and they rhyme, it's Keenan Bean. Okay. That was our key decider, actually. I don't, for me, it was. Yeah. All right, town clerk. Da, da, da. Then we are, with 2020, we file the tentative budget that we just I just presented to you guys. Then there'll be future amendments that we can make to it, should we so desire. Then we have a resolution to approve agreement for Adler Consulting for Professional Services on a left turn signal study, Old Tapan and King Road and Kings Highway, Main Street, Washington Street, in town of Orangetown. Then we have approval of the use of a road for the 2019 Velocity Rides and Cancer on Sunday, October 6th. Then approval and lend assistance for a 2019 American Legion 100th anniversary at Railroad Avenue, Pearl River, October 5th. Uh, and the American Legion nationally is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. So most of our American legions will be marking it some way. This is the Pearl River Legion's marking of it. 2019 agreement for stormwater education program with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rockland County, something we do annually. Parks and Rec, we have a resolution to approve a license agreement of Nike Park. Uh, I'll explain this a little. The 812th Military Police Company has asked to be able to periodically use Nike Park, which is the top of the mountain, for non munitions training. They will just be sort of driving and walking around up there with letting us know in advance. As someone who supports our military, I think it would be good to be able to let them use them that space. They need to get their training in and they are, uh, we're there, they're always there to help us when we've asked them for support in different ceremonies and such. And uh, so they're basically we're just letting them use it. They're indemnifying us and uh, they will let us know in advance in the times where we said that they could use it for training on average about once a month, maybe once every two months. Then approving the use of a showmobile for the 2019 Nyack Halloween Parade, Saturday, October 26th, always a good, good time. Approve lend aid for the Traubin Fest at the, uh, at the Masonic Fairgrounds. We're speaking of the Masonic Fairgrounds, great job by the Sons of Italy this past weekend at the annual Italian Feast, 10 years, went really well. Also, the 2019 South Orange Town Day is going to be getting some assistance for their event over at, uh, where are they having it this year? It's still at the Mance? It doesn't say on here. It's back over at Yugo? Oh. Okay. We'll clarify that for the announcements next time. All right. Then the 2019 Escape New York race 
We're approving use of the rail trail and some various roads throughout the town for that on the 21st, 2019. Lending assistance for the 2019 Pearl River Day Festival, October 12th, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Lending assistance. Mr. Carmelo, I think, he's most of our tailors, but he's certainly my tailor. And Rob, I think you said you were, he was your communion tailor, right? 50th anniversary of being in business, 50 straight years working as a tailor. So he's having an event on, on, uh, on the 28th in front of his, bu his building, blocking off a couple spaces for that. Then we're granting permission for David Alvarez to attend math for water and wastewater operators training, which sounds very dry and boring, but he needs to do it. Then we're also letting him attend a collection system inflow and infiltration training, somehow more boring than the other one. <laughs> then we are going to adjust some DME budget lines that were not exactly the way they should have been based on previous projections. So just uh, readjusting what, li what lines different amounts of monies are in so it's more accurate based on actual spending. Um, some of it was based on, this is due largely to the Yonkers contracting company uh, reimbursement of damages they did to some of our sewer lines. Personnel were accepting the resignation retirement of several employees from the town with regret. Then we're approving the 2019 budget adjustments for tw that are our current year budget adjustments to reflect our new title search inspection fees. As we know, we recently allowed for on-site inspections for title search changes um, that also caused a higher expense in it, but we are offsetting it with more revenue, so those both are being changed. 95,000 in new revenue, 75,000 new expenses. Appointing Caitlin Morrison to assessing clerk one less than full-time permanent, no change in salary, audit, pay vouchers, and adjournment. Any questions before we go into public comment? Okay, so Given that we have a couple minutes before we can do these other two hearings that are going to be or the split second for one of them and then non existent for the other before 825, again, for the folks in the audience, 825 is the earliest I can start the TOD meeting. I'm not allowed legally to start before that, so I will not be. But I have a motion to open public comment. Thank you, Councilman Mr. Valentine, seconded by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So. For everyone here, this is general public comment. If you're here to talk about the TOD, I would ask that you not talk yet because it's not going to be on the record for the hearing then. Save that for then. This is for other subjects. You'll have three minutes. When the bell goes off, please wrap up the sentence you're in. You can talk about anything you want, but try to be polite. So first, we have Esther Baitler from Spark Hill. Good evening, Supervisor Day and town board members. Hi, for the record, my name is Esther Ann Haitler, and I'm a unique consumer who lives in Spark Hill. Tonight, I'm here to address all of you regarding doing a recreational booklet for people with developmental disabilities. I think that it's time that we change how we do a recreational booklet. There are agencies who have no recreation services whatsoever in this county. I am urging the board to please push this through. It's important to me and to my fellow venture consumers. I think for the new year that this should happen. I've never seen a booklet that comes out with kids grade through two to three, whatever, in the school district. Time to stop. We must have a booklet so that venture consumers and all the others, the other agencies, can go to these recreation activities. I, I really think the board should approve it. And it has to be approved now before this keeps going. I'm here to give you an announcement on November 2nd. Venture is celebrating their 50th anniversary at Venture Hall from 6 in the evening till 11. For information about prices being held at 230, Route 340 in Spark Hill. Um, for prices, please call Bill Sewell. It's 580-9383. And Cheryl Ward, 580-9380. I have approved this event. It will help 
to make our programs and services better. I just want to thank Jim Dean, who also goes out of his way to help us with these great events that happen. I'm urging the board to please attend this. We need the support now, not later. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Mandel of Pearl River. Whenever you're ready, Mike. Yes, that's right. Good evening, uh, Supervisor Tate, members of the town board for the record. Michael Mandel, a resident of Pearl River. Two things. Uh, you mentioned the parks before. I want to thank the uh, town board and supervisor for the great job they've done in Cherry Brook Park. The old uh, roller ring and the uh, park house, which is used for everything from drinking to drug use, uh, is gone. Plantings are in there, trees and shrubs. And the new playground for the uh, young children is fantastic. And the uh, use of uh, the rubber uh, base there rather than the old mulch is uh, greatly appreciated. And it's uh, living right nearby it. I see it's been used, it's being fully utilized by the people of the area who even not only walk but drive into the area. So thank you very much. Second thing I'd like to say tonight, I'd like the board to think about passing a resolution, maybe similar to what Yonkers is doing tonight or during this week, talking about vaping. If we look at vaping and what's happening now, and I'm not saying ban vaping because a lot of people use it as a way to stop smoking or reduce the use of cigarettes with the chemical properties that does create health problems. But more specifically, these new flavors, and flavors just like mango, mint, cream, menthol, are all being aimed at our middle school and high school students. That's who they're trying to hook now. It's a very profitable billion dollar industry it would be nice if we banned the use and sale of flavored uh, vaping products within the uh, Rockland County, if we could send something towards the legislature asking that. And what it reminds me of, if you look at some of the vaping things, it almost looks like, one of them looks like a, like a, uh, a computer stick. So when the parents say, oh, what's out? It's one of the new computer sticks. And it reminds me of what happened back in the uh, 80s when they had the crack epidemic and people would come home and they'd see the glass pipe and they'd ask the child what it was, and they'd say, oh, it's part of my chemistry project. A lot of parents don't see any of these things. They have no idea, and since there's no smell or after effects uh, that remain and linger in the air, I think it would be a good thing if we looked forward to it and started out within the county and be at the head forefront of uh, doing something in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Next, we have Rick Tannenbaum of Valley, Valley Cottage. <coughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Rick Tannenbaum, and I'm the Business Development Director for the Rockland County Business Journal. Oh. My name is Rick Tannenbaum. I'm the Business Development Director for the Rockland County Business Journal. As you know, we've been uh, covering the HNA Palisade story for uh, some months now, since January. And when we were here in July, there was a little bit of controversy back and forth because we were not able to reveal our sources, and you had received some assurances from HNA that they were not for sale. You also asked us to update you uh, as the story unfolded, which is what I'm here to do. So the, the buyers, which uh, we had identified in the earlier story, recently filed for bankruptcy in the Eastern District of New York. They file in the, in the Eastern District because they're based in Brooklyn. Uh, they had a $40 million contract, which was signed back in April of this year to buy the HNA. Uh, they put down an $8 million um, deposit. The first closing was set for August 12th. Uh, the the uh, buyer was unable to close, so they asked for a 30-day extension, which HNA granted to them. Um, they were not, for September 12th, actually this week, they were unable to close again. They were about to lose their $8 million deposit, so instead they filed uh, bankruptcy, which is a, a, a common technique that a real estate uh, venture would use to avoid a default and loss of their deposit. So they've asked the Eastern District Court for a 60-day extension uh, to, to uh, what happened is their, their funders had uh, backed out at the last minute and uh, they couldn't close, so they're looking for new funds for 60 days, and as long as the bankruptcy petition is pending and the court entertains it there, they'll probably get those 60 days. And um, 
we will keep reporting on it. And I guess if, you know, we do put the story in the Rockland County Business Journal at rcbizjournal.com, short commercial. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep you informed of what we know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that's the last of our sign-ins? I'll, I'll, I'll get into that after it's okay. It, 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 we wait till the end of the public comment that we kind of address the public comment. And most people aren't here for the meeting, sorry. I usually say that at the beginning. Is there anyone else here for non TOD, non Pearl River comment? Like, just you want to say something about something else? Yes. Um, I wanted to talk about two things. Um, I was going to not talk tonight, but then after you spoke, Supervisor Day, I actually thought of something to say. Mm -hmm. So um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is priorities. I'm a mother of seven, and I know about priorities. You have to set priorities. And um, I know a lot of times things that are controversial or popular um, get a lot of community support. Um, but it's the basic services that I really think um, we take for granted and we don't talk about as much please, I wanted to ask you in the budget to give them a high priority because really for the day in and day out of living in the town, it is the things like the picking up the snow and the police and things like that, the ambulances that come to the house that are the most important priorities for us. So um, I just wanted to say that, you know, keep your priorities straight, which I'm sure you're already going to do. But then the second thing I wanted to talk about um, and agree with Supervisor Day about something is that when it comes to contract neg negotiations as we're trying to keep the line on tax increases and, and keep taxes as low as possible, um, community cooperation in contract negotiations is very, very important. And I hope all the unions, as well as the town board, will um, take that seriously. We have to do what's best for the town. And I know I've often asked the question myself, would I rather have more police, or would I rather have better pay paid police? And I think the answer is, well, I'd rather have both. But I think it's a good question to ask at contract negotiations because w the town people really will suffer if services are cut that really are important to our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on a non Pearl River, technically could be Pearl River, not Pearl River downtown development topic? No? I have a motion to close the public comment by Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Just to touch on a couple of the things, uh, if, it's up to the board if you want to consider something on vaping. Personally, I think if we're going to say call on people to ban flavored vaping, we should be calling on them to ban flavored tobacco products as well because there are adults who use flavored vaping to not smoke tobacco. Also, we should note that most of these conditions that people have had are a result of cannabis ones vaping, which is a thing, and black market cannabis ones. Um, so if we want to consider and put it on a future agenda, we can, but we can maybe sort of sort that out, you know. Um, for HNA, thank you for a clear update. You know, one of the concerns I had last time was it was extremely vague and contradictory. This was actually a very specific and clear article, so thank you. HNA is a property in Palisades. For those of you who don't know, it's about 100 acres. It's got a conference center. It used to be the IBM property, for those of you who remember that. It was bought by another company and then by HNA, which is a Chinese company. They run a hotel. They HNA generally, on a national level, is trying to withdraw their assets because they overextended themselves. The folks at the local property were surprised by it, having talked to them. They were kept in the dark. Um, but basically, what was said is accurate. There's a developer who <coughs> develops some normal, some kind of not really held up to building code standards developments in the state, I would say, that has put in a bid on it, and he's having trouble getting the money together. 
So our hope is that it does fall through because this guy doesn't seem like the best guy to have in town. That said, it's privately owned, and we will make sure that the codes are enforced. We're not going to downzone it. We're not going to allow residential. We're not going to do anything other than allow a hotel or other uses that are commercial that are currently allowed there to be done there, period. So we will be watching it closely. I'm currently trying to get to someone at H&A who's above the people that I always talk to as a local business because they obviously, if they're kept in the dark, then they're not the person I want to talk to. You know, we got to talk to the decision maker. So we're trying to find a way up that chain to try to get in touch so in case there's something else that we can do at the town level. Um, but it's something to keep an eye on. This is a reality that things that sit with massive tax bills eventually need to be offloaded. And if there's someone there with cash, when the company wants to sell, they're going to sell. Or when the individual wants to sell, they're going to sell. And we have to try to think of maybe some unique ways to head it off and figure out what we can do to try to make uh, and more viable properties viable so these things don't happen but um the fact that it's in bankruptcy court we'll see what happens there with that process maybe he'll lose eight million dollars maybe he'll just give it back to him and say go away we'll see um i think that about covered anything else on the public comment guys uh, on h and a we should consider having another public hearing and revoking the zone change that the rest of the board that i voted against that we gave them so they could operate as a hotel, which I said to everyone on this board, don't trust these guys, I don't trust them. So we should have a public hearing and revoke the zone change that we gave them and see how that plays in the commercial market. That's what I think we should do. I have no problem doing that. I will say that the use of a hotel is not, I think, a risky use, but just to, because they did pledge to us they weren't selling, I have no problem holding it. They came here it. with unclean hands, and I don't care who we talk to, they lied to us. They lie to you, and they're not good neighbors, and they got a benefit from some of us on this board, and I, I think we should consider having a hearing revoking the zone change we gave them. Just to clarify so that everybody understands what happened, IBM was a conference center, and they were allowed only to rent the rooms out if they were having a conference in the conference center. Before H&A bought the property, the previous person started using it for a hotel where he was renting out the rooms without people necessarily being in a conference. H&A continued that practice and then came in when, when the town found out that they were doing that and tried to put a stop to it and asked for a zoning change to be allowed to rent the rooms on a nightly basis instead of it being rentable in conjunction with a, um, a conference. So. Yep. I agree. I just think we have to make sure that we uh, I think are any careful reason we can when get you them give, in here. Right. At least to get them in here would yeah. be a good idea. Well, it's, it's clear. The zone change was given in October of 2018. It's just not clear the, to me the, about the what happened with the McGee case April, that when you, re, when you take well, back a change that you allowed. They but, didn't start anything, but he did anything, the McGee. So, but, I, but they're, like they're, I said, I just want the even, lawyers to make they're sure. They're not even a contract. They're a contract vendee. The applicant came in, they got the zone change, I believe it was October 23rd, 2018. They're in contract in April of 2019. If, well, the contract, I thought, all right, January, even, even better. So they came in here knowing that they were lying to this board, and then as soon as they got the zone change, they started marketing, and it, it makes the property worth more if you're allowed to market it as a hotel as opposed to as a conference center. You're right. But that, but that the one issue I will state is that at the time, it was, we all, I at least stated, I know Dennis did, and I think Paul said, even if we, we I said, they say they're not selling, but even if they are selling, I'd rather be able to be sold to a hotel operator than all the other potential uses that go in there and increase the value of the property so that people don't snag it off on the, on the, on the as, as a less valuable property. I don't think that the change, I don't think the change itself caused any problem, but I do think that it would merit bringing them in and having them at least take, explain to us what the heck was going on here and why they, why they, why they represented they weren't moving. I didn't know either way where they were moving, and I think it was still the right call to do it given the situation. Yeah, and I but, think if I, and Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, that we limited some of the other uses they yes. were allowed to do, which actually put us in a better position that they couldn't do some of the things that were allowed in the current zone once we granted them the zone change. Well, Wasn't it like it a was special size, permit? Yeah. Not necessarily. Not it was, it, it was more along the lines of granting them permission to do, I, I think somebody said earlier, everything that they could do before they, they were still, do. still allowed to do. But 
in allowing them to do the hotel, uh, we're, the board put more conditions on it than you ordinarily might not get. The zone they would have been in would have allowed more density of building. We didn't give that to them. We just gave them the use from the zone, and we kept the density the same. Yeah, so we, all they got was we, hotel instead of conference center and, and lecture facilities with, with bar, bar and bar mitzvahs. They we got. also prohibited them, prohibited them from uh, putting any other stores. Separate, would, standalone would, stores. We right, prohibited so that. They couldn't develop the property around it. And yeah. uh, also, if you remember, the community was supportive of, that, of the company at the time. Uh, they came out and they were supportive of it. They said they were good neighbors. Um, but uh, I agree with Tom at this point no, that changed, I think that we, we, we look into it and find out we, what we can do. I'm, I'm trying to get the right contact. I think you and Mary bring them in for the board, at least explain themselves, make them sweat a little bit. Yeah, I think so it's kind of just kind of a crock. It's a great idea to bring them in here yeah. because that's the only way we may get an answer. Yeah. It may not be a truthful answer, but we'll get an answer. At least we can make them take an evening out of their schedule and annoy them. Okay. What time is it now? It's 8.20. Let's get through the quick open and closing of the other hearings, and then we'll probably be right at the start of the time for the public hearing for Pearl River here. It's 8.21. The computers are ahead by two minutes for some reason. Oh, we're all on computers now. We used to be paper. Now we're going paper-free. We're on t laptops and uh, tablets up here. A little plug for our IT. Okay. You're nervous? So far, so good, Jerry. I'm impressed. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and we have to open and then continue this public hearing. Number, we're going to go item number three. I number I number three. Uh, do I have a motion to open the public hearing for the proposed zone change for five, five seven three route three hundred three? Motion moved by Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Rob, we have a letter from the applicant requesting an extension. Correct? Right. The applicant indicated he uh, may want to change uh, the application, so he's requested that it be continued to uh, the second meeting in October, which is the 22nd. All right. So then do I have a motion to continue the public hearing to October 22nd at 7.50 p.m.? Yeah. Motion by Councilman Divney, second by Councilman. I have to abstain. On oh, yeah. One abstention. You also, also please count up Paul's an abstention on the opening of the public hearing as well. Jerry's going to second it. All in favor? Three zero one in favor of continuing to ten twenty two. Uh, we're going to have to rescind. Do you have a motion to rescind resolution number four zero nine for the public hearing that was supposed to be scheduled for right now for Haram Place? Move. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. And then, do I have a motion to set public hearing for same property ten one seven fifty five p.m. Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari, all in favor? Aye. That was only one minute? Jeez, okay. We're going to get a few more done, folks. Before 8.25, really just walked in, is the earliest we can legally start, because that was what was announced. So two more minutes. We'll skip the next one, skip the next one. Motion to set to uh, allow the alcohol beverages at the Pro Day Festival in accordance with SLA rules. Is there a motion? I just got a question. Is it going to yes. be one, or is each business going to have to get their own permit? Yeah. Each, each business has to get their own yeah. permit. And We're, this is just what happens. They go on the sidewalk or they're allowed to open outside. And it came up last year, really, that um, they should be getting permission from the town. It really hadn't been happening. But well, it's, all, it's subject to SLA uh, regulations, subject to their uh, permits. They have to stay within a certain area. Well, um, yeah, all right. I, I like that. Uh, I think we should send notices out to all the businesses that sell alcohol and tell them, that they've got to get permission from the town and they've got to get an SLA license that day. So this is our this is the permission from the town to right. do it, theoretically. And then as long as they do it within the confines of the, the Chamber of Commerce event, they either just need to do it with the SLA, SLA right. at that point, this right? Is a, right, this is a Chamber-sponsored event. The Chamber has asked for that permission generally. And again, it's just for the area that each individual um, establishment is permitted to operate in just that area not you know the whole thing not yeah. the entire area yeah so don't and, and again pursuant to the sla and again we, last year it was done uh i did see a report that uh was done by the police department and you know in terms of whether uh there was compliance or not but um you know the police are there and and make reports and and it's up to the sla to uh enforce it you know and, and they're subject to losing they're uh, licensed if they're not in they, compliance. They'd have to get a permit and yeah. show where the, where their bar is going to be, whatever Where their drinking it. area is. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so do I have a motion for this one? Move. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. I think we can get one more in here. 
Uh, we're not voting on the planning board one. Accept the resignation of Chief Butterworth from the OEM committee since he's the chief now. Moved. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's put Brown and then we'll get to the whole. Yeah, thing. we'll get through Brown. We'll finish the topic up. Captain Brown, appoint to the OEM committee. Moved. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? We'll do the one more on the OEM committee. Frederick Sims, appointment to the OEM committee. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and go back. And do I have a motion to open the public hearing on the proposed TOD zone in Pearl River? Moved. Councilman Divney. Second by Councilman Batari. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. If this doesn't turn on, I'm going to be upset at RIT, Huge. folks. I'm, I'm going to go from here, so. You're pointed at that. At that? Oh, at that. Oh, that'll do it. I'm usually tech literate. This is confusing to me. That's not. He said to wait a minute. It's not going on. I don't know what's happening. Wait, hey. it blinked. There we go. Okay, it's blinking green now. It was just while you're doing that. Uh, Crisis of Can we go through the notices and everything? Right. So I Did you want cover up my ineptness? You want me to take care of it? The, the, uh, the, uh, there was a notice public hearing that was um, published in the newspaper. It was also uh, sent to all property owners. Um, who basically squared the town from, you know, let's say Gilbert over to Crooked Hill from, I believe, 304 uh, to either John or Middletown. But in any event, um, the purpose of the hearing uh, was set forth there. It was made clear that uh, there's no vote tonight. It's just, it's just uh, uh, an opportunity to present uh, what um, was being proposed and to hear from the public on it before anything further was done. Uh, you'll explain that a little later. But in terms of um, any other issues, uh, it hasn't been circulated to the county. It hasn't been circulated to uh, the Orange Town Planning Board. So um, it's really just uh, very preliminary stages because of uh, you know the scope and intensity of it. It's really um, just the beginning. So it was published, and it was, um, and those property owners uh, were notified. You know, beyond what ordinarily would be required, it was more to get the notice out so that you know, folks who would be uh, affected would not. So uh, in addition to other um, requirements, but there will be further public notices if it were to go further. Right, so basically, folks, is what, what Rob's saying in, in layman's terms is this meeting is just informational. We had, the way this all started, so everyone knows where we're coming from here, is about, was it May or June of 2018, the Pearl River Com Chamber of Commerce and several other residents came in and asked for us to do some work on trying to figure out what we can do to make the downtown of Pearl River more vibrant, more long-lasting, and less likely to continue to have trouble with people paying their rents and with landlords not putting money into the buildings and things just sort of chugging along in a manner that doesn't allow businesses to really succeed and grow, especially in light of the national trends in retail. Um, other residents wanted some improvements to the appearances and things like that, uh, improvements to parking. So we started at that point a downtown revitalization study. Some of you may have been at that one of those meetings or seen the boards that went out at the public library, that sort of thing. Uh, several recommendations came out of that, some of which we've implemented already. We've done an adopt a spot at Bronzedorf Park in front of the train station. We're doing a traffic study on the flow around the train station to see what a better workout could be to make that a little better. We've painted the train station building itself. We're working on re redoing the police building. We got a new flagpole. Uh, done through Congresswoman Lowy at the, at the post office. We painted our flagpole. Um, we passed rules and new regulations regarding our parking permits. What we found out was that our parking lots were basically sitting empty while the streets were being filled up by people who could have used the lots because the rules deterred the use of our parking lots. So we changed the permit process to encourage people to use the parking lots, which are only a block away from the downtown. And uh, that has resulted in increased usage. We also passed uh, and, and brought on a firm that does mobile parking payments to allow people to pay by credit card without actually increasing the cost to people who still want to pay by cash. You see in Nyack, they have those big fancy meters and everyone pays a dollar instead of a quarter. We kept the same old plug and chug meters and then people want to use the convenience of a credit card, they get charged a fee. So it was kind of the best compromise for both worlds and that's been a very, very successful program. Um, I was actually kind of surprised by how well it took off. Um, we've done some other work in terms of beautification. Uh, we continue to do that. We have a de beautification committee, and we're working on other things in terms of traffic studies and stuff like that, uh, new signage coming to the downtown. Uh, so 
basically one of the other things that came out of this was to consider transit-oriented development. That used to be called millennial housing, but us millennials apparently have aged out of the term, so I guess it's Generation Z housing at this point, but they just switched to TOD so they don't have to update it. Now we're all raising families as millennials, so we're not cool anymore. Um, but Gen Z, <laughs> just move said that. Um, so basically, it's look at this and see what we can do. The idea is there are already apartments in downtown Pearl River. They just predate the zoning code. Can we sort of level out the playing field for the other buildings in the Central Avenue vicinity and allow for more apartments for folks who are not able to buy a house yet but are out of college to come back into town, be on a train line? And then one of the things that we hear from the New Jersey Transit and the Metro North constantly, and one good news is that we saw a proposal from Governor Cuomo, and I rarely say those two words together, Governor Cuomo, good news, but about 170-something million dollars planned for improvements in west of Hudson rail service. So that's good. It's a small percentage of the five billion he's proposing, but it's more than the zero that's in there right now. So that would help, but the thing we hear from the New Jersey Transit and from MTA is that we won't add new train service if you don't have more ridership. Well, that's a chicken and the egg thing. Who wants to ride a train that's not working, right? But if you have more people right there, you're more likely to ride it. Um, then those people shop in the downtowns. And of course, we have the same concerns that we heard from residents about parking and things like that and making sure that anything that's done is in keeping with the character of Pearl River. I'll note that Nanuet just passed the TOD zone while Clarkstown did for Nanuet. That actually would allow for more density than what this proposal as currently structured has. Park we have Park Ridge did it too, but we have, we brought on Mazer Consulting and Marsha Schiffman is in the lead there. And they did a great job of putting together a concept that we all could at least sit there and say, this is something worth presenting to the people of Orangetown so we can all have a community conversation about it. No one's made a decision about whether this is the final version, whether there is a final version, whether we're gonna go forward or go backward or change. We wanna take this and talk about it, but it's at least in the realm of consideration, something that people aren't gonna scoff at. It's like we're talking about putting the Empire State Building you know, in Bronzoff Park here. It's something that's in keeping generally with the concept of what Pearl River is a community. So this presentation was given by Marsha to us. I'm gonna go ahead and go through it, generally speaking, for the folks here. There'll be an opportunity for you to offer comment if you would like to, ask questions if you would like to. And again, this is just a hearing session, a listening session, so we can set another date. We didn't wanna notice all the adjacent agencies and have them start commenting until we got your comments first, so we can make a first round of edits if necessary and not waste that back and forth time. And also not make you think we were kinda of like making the decision to go forward this exact version as is. So I'm gonna take it through. It's, uh, I'll try to keep it exciting. There's some renderings in it. So this is the area we're talking about. If you see the dashed line, those of you who aren't good at maps, that's 304 and your northern, your upper, upper is this the laser pointer? Where's the laser pointer? Uh, how do I do it? Oh wait, it's not on. Who didn't turn on my laser pointer? There we go. 304 goes all the way up here, right before the, this is all that sort of storage yard area with the different plumbers and landscapers. Comes down here. Then you have uh, Washington Avenue going here. Then you have John Street. Then you have uh, this, the back side of the properties on Franklin Street kind of meanders its way across to William. And then down again over to Madison. And then back to 304. Everything within those red bounds is what the area we're looking at when we talk about a downtown TOD concept for Pearl River. And everyone basically in almost the entirety of Pearl River outside of this area, like you'd be all the way out there, that dot is, and all the way over here, they all got mailers on this event. So you can, we can get all your opinion. These are some shots of the current situation in downtown. You've all seen that. I'm gonna skim through that because you kind of know what Pearl River looks like already, I'd imagine. You can see some buildings of apartments. Some have nice big columns. We got some that don't. There's a vinyl siding one. Not the most pleasant style of apartment, but still apartments. This here is a new development. This was the, uh, we got the apartments up here, the, the, the what's it called, old movie theater? Senior, yeah, senior housing. Movie theater. So uh, commercial underneath, a couple floors of residential on top as exists. These ones you could see down further along next to the saloon, the former horse and jockey, you've got nothing above them, but there's some shots here. Defiant has an Oktoberfest coming up if you're interested. More shots of our park. Okay, this is a little complicated. I'm gonna skim the stuff that's a little dry here, but basically this shows what's being used. You got industrial for purple, you got commercial over here, you got residential, you got some mixed uh, offices, 
So it's kind of a mixture of different uses. The yellow is true residential, just straight up houses. And this is, again, for those of you who are map challenged, central, 304, Maine. Okay, back in the, in the comprehensive plan's kind of old. And I was going to get to the next couple of years, but maybe the next supervisor will. We got updated. 2003 comprehensive plan de describes it as a mixed downtown area, add additional, and the goal of the comprehensive plan as passed in 03 was add additional opportunities for development while limiting controlling retail uses outside the immediate confines. We're focusing on the downtown because there's stuff in the downtown area. We don't want sprawl. We want to keep it compact. And then the 18 study we were talking about, the analysis from that downtown said it's well positioned physically and economically for some kind of infill redevelopment, especially in around the station area where that old industrial stuff is. The scale must be in keeping with the community character based on community feedback and based on what we all thought already. Here's some of the goals. We want to use the train station as a catalyst for future redevelopment in the heart of Pearl River. We're going to promote redevelopment. This theoretically would, I should say, promote redevelopment around the train station and maintain a diversity of entertainment, retail, and service uses together with residential housing. Guide the development in accordance with a plan of mixed uses that we adopt so that we know what things will go in eventually. We're not, the whole concept here is we're not talking about saying we're going to go in and build something. And we're not talking about saying this is all going to go in at once. We want to set a set of rules by which development can occur when landowners choose to do it. Uh, support more diverse housing choices. Have some places for our kids to come back and live in an apartment while they're waiting to save up the money for a home. Adopt design standards. This is important. Design standards to maintain and enhance architectural character of the Prover TOD district. So the downtown in this proposed zone would have an appearance code that if you want to put in the stuff that makes your property more valuable, you've got to make it look nicer in accordance with the code. And then protect to conserve the value of the land and encourage revitalization of the buildings in the TOD district. So this is the proposed district map. So you can see there's different types of zones, different types of TOD zones with different densities and different types of commercial uses. Generally speaking, this strip here on John, and if you recall, I'm sure you've noticed when you stand down here, you can't really see up here because it's a hill. It gets pretty steep. You got the saloon at what, four stories now or three and a half stories? It's probably about even with the basement of buildings up here based on how steep that hill is at the roof of their building to the basement of the ones on John. So the, the height as con conceived in this increases as you get towards a train station. So the zone would then allow this light purple-ish and light, tan, light pinkish strip from John to the, around the, around the uh, park. And the park, in case I forget, would not be redeveloped in this case. It's parkland. It would stay parkland, the, uh, the square, uh, Central Avenue field, to be clear. That would be one story of commercial of some type with one story of residential of some type above it, of apartments above it. The per darker purple area is a mixed-use zone. And I'll get into the details of that, basically what you imagine a downtown to be, bars, restaurants, that sort of thing. The lighter on the edges, that's mixed office space. So you have the supporting things like banks, stuff like that, where it's a less of an impact. So you have a transition of calmer uses as you get towards the more residential area. Then in this zone here, the darker purple, or the regular purple, and the sort of peach, we'll call it, this is two stories of apartments above one story of commercial. That is generally what you see in this area anyway with a lot of these buildings that were built already. Then when you get to the more true TOD build something new area, which is the industrial area here, obviously you may not knock down these bars, but the point is you have industrial areas. This is a TOD three zone, which would allow three stories of residential, but not four stories of height. So you, don't, you either do a one story below of commercial and two stories of residential or three stories residential total. <coughs> In this area here, you have the office, office uses, bank uses, and downtown mixed use uses. That's the, the purples and the blues versus the yellows and the peaches. All right. In this area here, because this would be new infill development, it requires that you include parking for each unit. And I'll get into the details that you put in when you build the property. These ones, there's an alternative where you'd be allowed to put in a large cash payment per unit because it's physically not possible in a lot of these buildings to put in parking based on the size of the lots. So this is the TOD, mixed use one, two, and three. These are the permitted uses, commercial types of uses. Retail stores, personal service establishments, business, professional, medical offices, banks, public uses, the multifamily, which is apartments. Some people get confused between the two. That's the same for all of them. That's in both of them, and we'll get into that. Conditional uses, which means by permit of the ZBA or the planning board. 
bars, nightclubs, microbrews, farmers markets, child and adult daycares, parking structures. One thing we added here is microbrews. That wasn't a thing that existed when the last zone was written, but now we actually have it in the zone as proposed. Accessory uses, parking, et cetera, the usual things, outdoor dining. Certain retail uses wouldn't be permitted. You can't have any drive-in restaurants, no gas and auto service stations, no gun sales, no adult entertainment, no tobacco stores, no vape shops, no massage shops, no flea markets, no tattoo parlors, no pawn shops. If there's already a tattoo parlor in that spot, they're grandfathered in, obviously, but you cannot add these things. Why? Because these are the sort of uses you find in CD downtowns, and we don't want that. Well, I mean, I get to, I have three tattoos myself, but still, you don't want to, your downtown filled with tattoo shops and gun shops. Permitted uses, TOD office, these are the outside outskirts. Business, professional, medical offices, banks, public uses. Conditional uses, child and adult daycare centers, data centers, parking structures, accessory uses, the usual stuff you might have with that. Less intense uses, so you're not keeping folks up in the residential area around the edges of the downtown. These are additional regulations for all of the zones. We limit the size total for individual businesses to a maximum of 5,000 square foot. That avoids large box retailers coming in and, do, and taking over the downtown. The resident multifamily units, the apartments in mixed use buildings except level three uh, permits solely, they, they have to be basically, you have to, in order to build residential, you have to build commercial except in TOD three where you could build straight up residential. So by the train station, it could be only residential and the others, you have to have that first floor of commercial to keep the downtown mixed use appeal. There are no single family, two family detached dwellings permitted to be built. If one exists, it's grandfathered in. That's how all these things work when you rezone. It can be knocked down and built in this manner, but it can't be built in another single family home style. And this is the mix as proposed. We wanna have smaller apartments because we don't wanna have folks that are gonna be living in five, six bedroom apartments. You know, So we have 80%, it must be studio or one bedroom, Maximum of 20% two bedroom and no three bedroom or larger units permitted. Maximum unit size, minimum of 600 square foot, maximum of 1500 square foot. We don't want people building full, whole, build, whole block sized apartments. Full kitchen facilities required, balconies will be permitted. Building and design, we'll get to the appearance design code towards the end of this presentation. These are the three multifamily residential levels. The TOD of different types one, you get one floor of residential with a maximum of five units per acre. You divide your size by the number of acres, that's how many units you get. So if you're at a quarter, quarter acre, you get one, you round up. So you get two units on a quarter acre, basically. So it boils at two apartments on a floor. This is the same density, five per floor, so 10 per acre, and then 15 per acre in TOD3. As you're getting closer to the train station, basically it increases. It's uh, related to the permitted floors, but units could be constructed on less than permitted floors. Let's say you wanted to do only one additional floor here, but have the same number of units because of the shape of your lot, you could do that. The minimum size you would need to do it is a 0.1 acre, and the minimum, lot, minimum units you would get on a 0.1 acre size lot is two per floor per acre, which is about 0.1 is kind of the small size physical lot you see in the downtown, like at the Domino's area. Those are tiny little lots. The most you could put in is two units per floor there. TOD parking space requirements. Minimum parking requirements provided on grade, underground, and within the building on site. So basically, you have to provide these things on site here, this amount of calculation based on your uses that you have in the TOD3 zone. In the TODs one and two, you can contribute $15,000 per required parking space to fund the additional municipal parking. There are some lots that are not owned by the town right now that could be. Lots we have that could be realigned to increase the amount of parking. So obviously you can't magically create space in a building that's from the 1890s and is surrounded by other buildings, so you can pay a good chunk of change. So let's say you have a retail that the use requires 20 parking spots and you have 10 apartments. That's one point, they're all one bedrooms to make it easy. That's 1.25 parking spots per apartment and another 20 spots per, per retail. That's how many spots you have to provide on-site if you're TOD3 or combined between on-site and paid if you're in TODs one and two. Does that make sense? Everyone just nod. If you're confused, raise your hand. Okay. So basically we're requiring people to buy parking on-site, generally speaking. Some bulk regulations, this is a little more boring, but basically uh, 
you are, if existing property, your existing building footprint is not changed, you're grandfathered in for your existing lot size, and you know, if you fill it up a little too much or not as much as you would normally, wherever it is, it's okay, as long as you keep that same footprint. Or you have to do it with this area where you have a 25 foot buffer area when you're abutting a residential zone, so the edges of the, t the downtown. Uh, the minimum and maximum front yard bill lines are designed to encourage people to build on the street line like a downtown and not set it back like a shopping center. We don't want people to build it the way, say, New City is in Clarkstown, where you got, you got a, everyone has to park in front and you don't have a downtown anymore. We want them to build the way Pearl River is. So this is here, the setbacks, basically maximum building heights and what, what your residential uses are permitted. And you are allowed to boot the first floor as parking so you get a little more height if you do that. But the parking would be covered up like the facade of a regular building as in the appearance code. You wouldn't see any parking structure in those cases. That covers the density and the proposed uses. Now we're gonna go into the design guidelines that will go along with this. Basically, we're doing this because we want it to look nice, be historic looking, be enjoyable, be pleasant, and get something out of letting people do more with their properties. This is generally what we're looking at. You see these style of buildings where you're talking about this crown on top, flattish roof, kind of a, a little like mold trim around the window, brick or stone facing, a nice more ornate bottom side that has a commercial look for the commercial side of it. That's kind of generally what we're looking at with a certain color palette and everything. This is all written out in words, but it's very confusing to read appearances in words, so it's being presented in pictures. But you can always read on the town, town website what the actual written description of these are. This is a, a roof rule, so basically you can have a peak on your roof, but you can't see the peak from the ground, that's the rule. So you can have it appear to be a flat roof and not be, because sometimes those are easier to maintain. Sometimes some buildings you see now in downtown, they have that vinyl siding look with the peaked roof. If someone wanted to build in this way, they'd have to redo that and make it look nicer. These are some example entrances. So if you're at a corner, you could build around the corner like this and make it look sort of like a grand entrance. This is a primary entrance to a store on a main front. More of a, uh, you get a little awning out there, glass windows, some sort of trim before you get to the brick or stone standard residential size windows there. These are some example, these are imagery that conveys what our code would permit someone to build. So as example imagery, again, you got some little balconies, window balconies, you get some glass so you could see into the uh, commercial establishments small awnings, which we do see already in Pearl River. We also see some of those balconies in Pearl River. Signage, we wanna have a signage code to prevent gaudy out of character signs that would not fit in a downtown. So these are the type of more ornate, you get a hanging signs are permitted, stylish signs like that, but no neon lights, no, no blinking things. Window art is permitted to a certain degree. All these things would go through our ACABOR, which would approve the appearances based on they're fitting with the, with the code as written. And this is, uh, these are examples of what our town signage could look like, maybe with different color schemes, but this general concept of like welcome signs and parking lot signs to make it look nicer. This is something obviously, either if it's on private properties, a directional they'd have to do, or if the town wanted to update our signs to make it look a little more fancier, we would do. This goes through different examples, so like sort of a walkway, pedestrian walkway, calming system. Uh, the lighting, street lights actually right now are being repainted in the next few weeks um, to match with our new LED lights that will be done before the Pearl River Day Festival, but this is, these will stay the same generally. They're all nice structures. And generally speaking, if you're gonna put lights on private property, they're gonna have to match that style of ornate lighting. These are some other design standards. All utilities as put in will have to be underground. Street furniture will have to have certain rules about them to make sure that they look pleasant. Uh, there'll be sustainability rules and some landscaping elements that have to get approved. Um, and buffer areas, 25 foot wide setback, as we said, when you're touching a residential zone. These are some special things that would have to be addressed in the infill developments in TOD3, right by the train track. So there's gonna be site design approval so that if there's say an interior circulation driveway, it fits with the requirements of say a street so it looks natural, because some of those lots are bigger and they might have, a, maybe someone drives around to the back to park. Uh, the parking placement and requirements that we go through that. Open public spaces will be required on some of those properties. Um, there'll be some things done in terms of encouraging the use of like the Muddy Creek as like a, an appearance thing in that area as it goes through there. 
um, and then rules regulating the setbacks when you have multiple buildings on one single property. You don't get that issue along Central because they're such small lots, but these other ones are bigger lots. So we have those rules in this that require you to set them in certain ways so it still looks like a downtown and not like uh, one of the condo developments in Nanuet where it's just a residential condo development. And this here is just some concepts of what it could look like. These are again, <coughs> are could look like things. So this is the current Central Avenue, Route 304 Gateway, and you, this is the, that's the saloon, that's the little, uh, little uh, cafe there, the industrial area over here. Um, and this is again what it currently looks like right now from an aerial. This kind of shows what it might look like theoretically if someone were to take advantage of it. See now you have a little bit of a nice entryway. You, these things get, this roof here is now up because it's now even with the saloon. People are putting buildings on the street and parking in the rear to get, that, the, get the apartments on the, on the street because right now if you go back up again to compare, you see you have parking lots right on Central. You probably want to build them. The code would require you build it in a way that looks like a downtown. This would get built up. And a more of a welcome to Pearl River type feel as you come off of 304. This bump out may not be possible if the state doesn't let us, but it's just for illustrative purposes. It's just see what it could look like. This is an actual rendering of what that could look like theoretically. And no one's building this. This is just how the guidelines would guide people to do it if they were to do it. A gateway entry system where you get a nice big Pearl River sign. You get the things are put on the edge of the road, brought even with the height of the saloon there. That's how it could look theoretically if the code was done uh, by the property owners down in that area. And this is only, this is the densest you would see. The, two, the three floors of height is the densest you see and that's all the way down by 304. This is an example of what a pedestrian between two different buildings would look like anywhere in town in the downtown area. You have a nice little awning system, just a little fancier. Um, this is an image you could see Guild Days, great place, T-Mobile, good phones. The, this area doesn't have any apartments over it, right? So this is why it was chosen as an example of what it could look like. As you could see, T-Mobile still keeps their little logo. You could see Guild Days over there. This is an access, by the way, just so everyone's clear. This is how you get to our public parking right now. Signage is an issue there, okay? You can't really tell there's a public parking lot right there. So this area is a TOD2 zone, so you then allow have a big entrance to the parking to tell people this is where to go to get the heck off our street and park in the lot right there. There's no need, you can walk a block. And then you have the, some of these, these people decided, hey, we'll put in a couple of apartments, make it look a little nicer, get a little new facades on it. And that's where you end up in that area, which is similar to what you see kind of diagonal across the street already. And this is a little close up. Gil Days is gonna have to char we'll charge them for the uh, design inspiration later on and the free advertising. Generic retail store doing a good job. Parking sign, again, this is just some computer illustrations so you can kind of see what we're talking about. And then this is going towards the fire station. You can see these are certain areas you know, you live from Per River, there's like, this area is two stories already and there's a strip of just commercial with no residential. This is one of them. You got these buildings here, kind of a modern look, 1970s, uh, not so fancy modern look, I should say. This is what it could look like. They built to the same height as the fire station. This one decided not to, maybe this one didn't decide to, it depends on the place. And it just gets a nicer facade, gets the nice top there. And we're talking, again, the density is no more than five units per floor per acre, so this is probably a 0.1 acre lot, so you're looking at four apartments of one to two bedrooms on each uh, total on this one lot, maybe four on this one, this is all TOD too, so they could do it all on one floor, they maybe make it all on one floor. But the most apartments per building here you're looking at is four apartments per building that would be between zero and two bedrooms next to the fire station there. This is a close up view. Again, streetscape changes. You got fancier bottoms, you got the brick top, you get the little, uh, little awnings or balconies up there. So there are some improvements there. And then there's more photos so you can get a sense again of other towns that have things that would fit the design code a lot of this is up in the air in terms of what it is, because again, we're not building it. We're creating a code by which people can then do something should they so choose. Other mixed use buildings that kind of would fit the code we're talking about as written. You could see the, this is, these are all residential ones. These other ones are mixed use that we just went to. This is what an all residential one would look like if they did just three floors of residential down by the train station. Brick, stone, that sort of thing. Okay. You'll get your questions in a second. Just thank you. 
Okay. I think that pretty much covers it. I've talked a lot today. I had a budget presentation and this, so I'm getting a sore throat. So I'm going to let you folks talk now. Um, we have a few sign-ins. Just to go through this, can I just see, by show of hands, who wants to speak on the topic today? Because only three people signed in. I get a sense of maybe more than three. One, two, I I've got 15, here. 15 or so. Including questions. You can get up, just ask one question, yeah, sit down. Sure. Anyone who wants to get to a microphone, I just want to get a sense of how many we're talking about here. Okay. 15, All right. 15. You want to do three minutes per person and encourage people to get up there? And I then want five. It's public you want to do five? What do you think? Okay. With a cutoff, though, maybe. Because we are not voting tonight, obviously. It's only 9 o'clock, so 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. No matter what, we're going to just close it down at 11 and continue to another date. So hopefully we'll get everyone in here. If you have one question, ask the one question. Just when you get up there, Please state your name for the record. And your town. And your town, specifically your hamlet, because we do want to know if you're from Pearl River or not. Why is this not turning off now? Okay. I don't know why it's not turning off. Anyway, where's my remote? There's, I have like nine remotes up here. I apologize, everyone. All right. So first, again, the rules are you got now five minutes, not three, up to five minutes. Ask the questions. They're not going to be a back and forth during the course of your time. Rattle off your four questions if you have them. If it's something that needs to be addressed so that other people don't have the same questions, we'll answer them. If we don't know the answer, we'll ask. If we need to ask the experts to come up to answer them, we'll ask the experts to do it. If you just want to say your thoughts or other ideas you might have, you can do that too. But if you get to five minutes, please, for the respect to everyone else, wrap it up at that point uh, when the bell goes off. All right, so the first person to come up is uh, Shirley. Yeah. Gobel Christie, yes, that is it. That is it. They don't teach script in school anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Let me just reset this here. It's menu. One, three, four, five, enter. Five minutes. Enter. Enter. That didn't work. What the hell now? Menu. One. There we go. All right. Whenever you're ready. Good evening, Supervisor Day, Town Board, and Assembled Citizens. I am Shirley Goble Christie from Pearl River. My family has lived in Orange Town since the 1700s, so I am very vested in the area. And I was very interested to see what we're doing. I like the idea of adding buildings above the stores for people to live. I think that's great. What I do know from my schooling is that when you increase density of people, you need to also increase green space. And we haven't really addressed that. So you might want to consider allowing people to use the rooftop, perhaps for a couple of chairs, a lounge chair, a patio table, some planters, and so forth, to make it a little more appealing for the apartment dwellers and a way to escape because uh, they may not have balconies where they can set out and so forth. And the other comment I have is about the arch that says Pearl River. It's very generic. I've been to five towns this summer that are revitalized, mostly towns from the 1800s that peaked in the early 1800s, and they often use this arch to announce who they are. The one town I found very interesting was Williamsport, PA. It peaked in the early 1800s with the logging business. But they have the uh, Little League World Series established there. So they didn't use an arch. They used the World Series to set themselves apart. As you arrive into town, they took the first four corner and turned it into a baseball diamond and they put bronze statues of little leaguers playing baseball there. So they announced themselves in a better way, I think, aesthetically. And I know Pearl River is known for it, the electric light, which we had established here. So maybe instead of an arch, something wonderful with lighting down there, and maybe around the park and the train station to give people more of an announcement of the area. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that's a good idea that the arch was just presented as a, as like a general
concept, but I, I agree when it's done, if it's done, it should be specific to Pearl River. Absolutely. Um, Lyons is the last name. Ann. I've lived in the community for 50 years. This is my first town meeting, and I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm not prepared. What was that, Shirley? Yeah. Beautiful speaker. <laughs> that was very nice. Hello. Hello. I don't know a lot about this, I'm sorry to say. I live on Ridge Street. I walked up and down Ridge Street. I don't, is anybody, I'm looking, I don't recognize. Hi. And I tried to find some neighbors that knew about this. None of us did. I heard a gentleman say that notices went out to some place as wide as Gilbert to Crooked Hill Road, I think you said. And I am the only person that received a notice. I have a list of the names of people that did not, didn't even know about this. And when I went online, this wasn't there when I got the notice. It wasn't until this afternoon that I was able to go online and see this. And not for nothing, but when you went through this as somebody coming in here to address the concerns I have, I was really disappointed how fast you went over those yellow spots that are the homes on Pearl River that are being changed to places that can become parking lots. They, these are now homes, and if you change those now, the next person come in can change my street, and of course the street, according to what can be built there, is not what I have my home in for Pearl River. Now I'm also here because I'm glad you're not voting. My voice is shaking, isn't it? Now you all know. <laughs> but every person I spoke to, Marcy Elliott, uh, you don't need their names. They live on Pearl River, on Ridge Street. Um, want to see a letter. They don't understand if they're taxpayers, how they didn't get one. I'm concerned as why I was the only one that did. One person gave it to her son, and, every, and when he read it, he really, um, this is kind of a joke, but it's not. He was more concerned about that it was grammatically incorrect. So that was his comment, and she used to work for the town, so I don't want to give you her name, but now you probably figure it out. So there are a lot of people on this street that are concerned. They only found out about it within the past 24 to 36 hours, depending on when I got home from work. So if you're putting this to a vote, or it's coming up to something soon, I happen to know that at least 27 families from my street want time, they want to come in here, they want to know what it is, and particularly the houses on Pearl R on Ridge Street that you're changing to that OR2. And they were, it will be a testing meeting. These people were really shocked when I went around and I showed this thing today. Thank you. And that's it. All right. All right. So I'll be more prepared next time. No, you're fine. It, just to be clear, I don't know why that street would not have gotten mailers oh. because it was within the zone to be mailed. So we will have to investigate that because the entirety of Pearl River from the Jersey border up across to basically Blue Hill and all the way up to uh, Crooked Hill and park practically to the Clarkstown border was supposed to have gotten a piece of mail each individual home. And I apologize if it seemed like I was glossing over anything. I certainly wasn't. And I don't know why. And that's why I'm concerned as well as you. So they should have been. Every single house in that box was supposed to have been mailed. So we will look into it. We're not voting tonight. We would, that is not necessarily the final thing. Nothing is finalized. We want your input. It's That's a why long way off. Way off. We're talking way multiple, off. multiple hearings. Months. Months and months. Not weeks. Yeah, no, too. thank you. And, and <laughs> thank you. And again, thank you. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm just trying to set the tone for the meeting and that no one is making a decision tonight. We're here to get your input. If mailings, if mailings didn't hit Ridge Street, it was an accident and, an, and some sort of error in the mailing, not because they weren't notified. Everyone in that district was supposed to have gotten a piece of mail, and we will look in to see what happened. Whether they were sent and not delivered, there was an issue with postage or whatever it was, we will make sure that's fixed, and we will continue to have hearings because that was not supposed to have occurred that way. So don't worry. Nothing's being voted on tonight. All right. Next we have Peter Torizen, Torizen of Pearl River. Real quick. Just yes. Uh, I live on Gilbert Avenue. I didn't get a, any notice either. I okay. did talk to my neighbor today, and he happened to bring it up. He got one. Okay. So that's something to take care of, probably. I got one quick question, and it's uh, tax-wise. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have to do any subsidizing of this stuff? No. 
That's not that's, not at all. Okay. No. That's basically it. Thank you. No, there will be no taxpayer dollars spent on the in individual apartments and buildings that are proposed in this. All right, now that we're done with the sign-ins, only three signed in, we're going to go by a show of hands. If I say sir or ma'am, just don't be offended, I point, yes? It's hard to see everyone's face from over here, even if I do know you. And when you get called up, please state your name for the record, and again, the Hamlet or village you live in. I'm assuming most people are Pearl River, but maybe there's a South Orange Town person mixed in there somewhere. Go ahead. Good evening. John Frawley, 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Pearl River, New York. My question is, it really does look beautiful. One of the things that you mentioned was parking. I live one block from 304 in downtown Pearl River, two blocks from St. Margaret's. I didn't get a letter. This affects me. But what affects me, what's going on right now, is parking. Now, my wife just retired from the library. Across the street from the library is taken every day by cars for ARC, or people parking for the train all day. Now you're going to make it worse. I'm all for change, especially good change, and if it's done right. But before we lose a child, which is more important than any of this stuff, you got to make sure women with children can get in and out of the library. This is going to only exacerbate a problem that's going on now. Now, I live three blocks from the train station. I have people parking now, and I live on, at the 60 meter of a 90 meter ski jump, and they're parking by me. So you do have a problem right now, and this is not gonna get better. When they were gonna do the parking for the trains that don't run worth a damn, the people that lived in Pearl River were supposed to get permits like they do in Nanuet. I know people in Pearl River that park now in Montvale because they don't have to pay. There's a lot of things that are going on here. There's a lot of great ideas. But before you start something like this, you got to take care of the crap that's going on right now. Arc is, you're going to lose a child because you got knuckleheads that drive up and down. Uh, a member of the Beaver Hat gang one day cut right in front of me, ran right through a stop sign, doing business on a phone. You got stuff going on in town. It's a beautiful town and that'll only make it better. But you gotta take care of the park and, and you gotta protect the kids' children. Thank you. Thank you. And for that street, the chief's here. We'll do some target enforcement, that's for sure. What's that? We'll do some targeted parking enforcement because they're not supposed to be parking there that long. Yes. Yep. I know you spoke already, Barbara. You can again, state your name for the record. Barbara Dello, Blavel. Um, the first thing I wanted to comment on, um, the facades are beautiful in the pictures, and um, I think beautiful is good. Um, but I have a couple of questions. Um, as I look at how it's planned out, um, it's stu mostly studios and one bedrooms, so that doesn't lend itself a lot to children. So it doesn't seem to have children. So I was wondering who is going to live here. So then that led me to think, what about the cost? Is it going to be upscale or moderate? Is it going to be like yuppie housing? Or is it going to be, um, I mean, if you have studios of moderate cost and a lot of bars, that doesn't sound good. Um, so that's what I wondered is like, who are the targeted people who are going to live there? Um, whether you're looking for a very upscale yuppie type development with no kids, or whether you're looking more for like um, the kind of population that currently lives upstairs in Pearl River. Um, so that was my second question. Um, the third thing or that I wanted to talk about was um, I did a lot of reading on sustainable development and sustainable development models. And this looks a lot like it, um, particularly in, it fits very well with one of the big sustainable development goals 
of moving population density out of the city into less dense areas. So, um, and, and um, mass transit. So that's kind of like right in sustainable development. And I wondered if this is just something that kind of came out spontaneously from within the community, or if it's um, kind of part of a larger planning of, you know, how land and, and you know, what did they call it? Um, population slash land fairness, where um, some urban areas have too much population and not enough land, and some other areas have a lot of land and not as much population, and that's not fair, and this might help equalize it out. But my biggest concern really is, is the issue of who's going to live there. So those are my, that's all I can make out of my notes. So thank you so much for listening, and um, you know, I think whether you support it or not will kind of depend on some of the answers to all the questions we, the people here have. Thank, thank you. you. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Mary Dolan. I live on Magnolia Street, and I did get your letter. Surprising, but most of my neighbors Thank did you. not. Okay. Well, you know, we're trying. Okay. We're going to mail the other ones, too, and we're going to see what was missed and deal with it. So well, in, yeah, in these, it, You can't make more land, and we haven't got enough parking spaces as it is. Those pictures were all beautiful, but they didn't show the parking they must have taken it on Sunday uh, in Pearl River. They did not show Pearl River the way Pearl River is every day. And you cannot get through Pearl River at 3 o'clock. It's amazing, but you can't. You just bumper to bumper. Do you think you were down in Manhattan? And unless you're going to make parking garages in the places you have, and the, the train that doesn't run, I mean, we are 30 minutes from New York. And uh, Cuomo is given $51 billion towards transportation, and we will not get tracks. I mean, we are a one-track town. And you're going to put a development in or encourage development based on a train that has one track. It's pathetic. I take the train probably five times a year. Twice I've been left on the station with all the other people. One time... Oh, uh, the take the train to the plane. You know that little ad that they had? Well, I was standing there, and the train didn't come. And I called, and they said, oh, yeah, the train came. You missed it. I said, well, everybody else missed it, too, because it didn't come. <laughs> and I, 20 minutes later, she called me back and said, they're sending the train from Hoboken, and it has to turn around in Spring Valley, and then it will pick you up. Well... I wasn't going to make my plane, so I had to call Airbrook. Now, here's the real insult. I couldn't get the money back on the tickets because they don't refund it even if the train doesn't come. It's pathetic. And when they, op when they put in those parking lots for the trains, I was there in the train station, and Kleiner and a whole bunch of the suits from the, from the MTA were there, and they said there would be no charge to anybody in Pearl River. I know people who've gotten tickets there. And then you're supposed to use that lot on, on the weekend. Last Friday night, we were out in, uh, to the saloon, and they told us you better put some money in the meter because they gave tickets another Friday night. That's pathetic. That is pathetic. I mean, somebody should tell the police department that this is not the way you run a town. And they also, another just a side issue, they couldn't get food on the top of the saloon, but they have it now. Did the, did the town stop them from serving food? Do you want liquor and no food? I mean, how silly is that? I, it just makes no sense. Uh, the property in town is just not enough for all of these uh, apartments. And right now, we have rental apartments of open 
20.1% or something. That's not counting all the ones that are condominiums or the people who bought their apartments. There's over 20% apartments now. I don't know what you, you want, but it just seems to me that it's, it's not viable. It's, there's no place for all of this. It would be nice if it looked like that, but you know it won't. And there is no parking. So no parking, no train. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Again, if, if I've met you and I don't say your name, it's the lights are in my eyes, so I apologize again in advance for that. Good evening. My name is Matthew Basis. I'm a Pearl River resident. Uh, just a couple of things. I, I love what this woman just said because uh, a lot of what she said is, I believe, we don't have the parking. The picture that I saw, you actually took parking away with one of the pictures. So, I mean, you're already starting to take parking away from the uh, community. So it's really not going to be beneficial. And I don't think that there's going to be enough area to do it. That's the first thing. The second, when you start building something like this, my question is, how much of this is going to be for low-income housing? That's one question. Is there going to be any kind of low-income housing that, that's going to be mandatory in, so no. whatever the apartments are? No, none. Secondly, you have studio one, two, and three-bedroom apartments. No threes. Uh, no threes. Okay, one, so studio, studio one, one and two-bedroom. Two. Yeah. So even with that, when you start bringing in, and I know that it may be in a limited capacity, but when you start bringing in children, the effect that it's going to have on the school systems is going to be tremendous. So what plan is going to be put into, or is it in effect, or is going to be put into effect, and is it even being looked at now as to how that's going to affect the school systems? Because if you put something like this where you're looking to put in four or 500 apartments through the whole place, if you're going to dump another three, 400 kids into the community, which is great, except where we're going to put them when it's kind of time for school. So, and with the apartments, the people that will be utilizing the school systems don't necessarily pay the taxes. So what is going to be put into effect to make sure that the money we need for the schools is going to be collected? And that's really all I have. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Traffic. I live on Holt Drive. I live about a high school. So seven between 7.15, 7.30, and right after school, it's pretty crowded now. I can only imagine what it's going to be if you dump another four or 500 families into this community. So, thank you. Thank you. There's a couple of things just to touch on from that because I didn't get to those. And I'm sure everyone shares those questions specifically. So first, um, these apartment buildings, uh, these are all commercial tax rateables. So those commercial property owners would pay taxes, increases the commercial tax base towards the schools and towards the town and the county, of course. The idea of, one, the school district in Pearl River in South Orange Town, it's not the way it was 20 years ago where they were like, no more kids. You know, it, they're hurting on enrollment, actually. And the idea is to minimize the impact by minimizing the amount of bedrooms. One thing that came with the, the, the total number of units, if someone were to bulldoze the entirety of the Pearl River downtown zone and start over from scratch, the most units you could fit in is about 400 under the current plan of zero, one, and of 20% two-bedroom apartments. They're not going to do that because they're all owned by hundreds of different property owners. So really what it's doing is we're talking about the area right around the train station where you could fit maybe 55 to 155 units, and then the rest will gradually fill in as property owners decide they want to add a floor here and there. And also, that's 400, says already about a, a couple hundred units in there as it is. There's 150 or something units in there already. So. We're talking netting that out, knock down those ones, and redo the ones to a total of 400 or so when there's already ones in there. This wouldn't add to that. It's, it's, it's cumulative. Um, so the issue with the, 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 the who's living theirs and, the, and, the, and that sort of thing, the, the intent is to create market rate ability for people who own the properties to rent at market rates to people who can afford those rates at zero, one, and two bedroom size. We don't want to have multi-family, like, six bedroom things like you see going on in uh what is the, the development the the new one pascac ridge where they got six bedroom apartments yeah and, or park ridge has got denser in another direction 
That's not what we're talking about. Smaller apartments to encourage the people to live there. We won't tell people who can live there. This is a private sector. This is property owners, and, and that's how the world is. But by structure and design, we're talking about people who are post-college, young professionals who are maybe engaged, who maybe have a toddler, who are not able to move into a house yet but want to be in Rockland because that's where they grew up and people who are empty nesters, who don't have kids anymore but want to be where things are happening. That's what naturally occurs in a TOD type situation because you're not going to have that, when you have a place that has an, an economy in a downtown and they're building, they're putting that much in, they're built, they're, you, that's what you generally end up with. It's not by legal statute and there, this would not, there is no provision whatsoever for low income or subsidized or section eight housing, whatever, anything like that. It's all just market rate studio one and two bedrooms as under the current proposal. And again, I'll reiterate, I'm gonna periodically say this, no one is doing this yet, no one is doing this as is. We are here. Anyone who asks, are you gonna figure this part out? Yes, you've asked us to figure it out and that's what this process is going to do. This is the startup process. So instead of asking, have you thought about it? Please think about it and we will. We're gonna keep having hearings until we figured it all out. We're just starting a concept here we're not at the point where we even have gone with the environmental, or gone with the noticing or anything like that. It's just listening. Okay, anyone else who would like to speak? We had a couple more hands. Yes. No, I'm sorry, it was actually, well, you're already walking up to sir in the back there, but it was actually the gentleman sitting there, but I kind of just did a, a bad hand raise. Yeah. You're up, <coughs> sir. Uh, I was pointing Sorry. at you, but I, I, I pointed <laughs> poorly at you, so he got the signal, and I apologize for that. I can't mail things or point well. <laughs> uh, my name is Pete O'Brien. I live on Franklin Avenue in Pearl River. Uh, I apologize. I got here late, so I missed everything. Um, <laughs> what is the um, – sorry, is there a, a place that we can see the presentation yes. you showed tonight? Yes, okay. and, and I'll, I'll I'm going to pause this for you here. Uh, pause, center. The – Presentation was already on the website from before. There's a straight on the town website for the TOD presentation. It's been on there for about a couple months now. Um, if you go to the town website, and the other thing, when you go to the town website, you're going to get a pop-up that says sign up for supervisor's updates. Put your email in, and this was also sent out via email. You'll get future updates from the town. But there's a link to the T Pro River TOD proposal on the main page. Click through. You can see the presentation and all the background documents beyond that to learn more detail. Okay. Um, one major issue for me is that this is called transit-oriented development, so this revolves majorly around New Jersey transit. Before we do anything, have we gotten any type of correspondence or commitment from them to up their service or the quality of the service or anything? Because if we don't get that, this is my concern. You build all this, the idea is you have millennials moving in, whatever, young families who maybe need one car, rather than more than that, and they're gonna work in the city and take the train. If New Jersey Transit doesn't up their game, you're gonna have a lot of empty apartments. And then the only people who will wanna move in are people who like to walk places and don't have tra need transportation into the city. And that could create a vacuum that I'd be concerned about personally. Um, was there anything in here about um, I have the same issue on Franklin Avenue. There's a school zone there. There's no parking for the library. Uh, I've complained multiple times about the speed uh, in the school zone, lack of parking for the library. For the parking issue, has anybody proposed doing uh, one-way streets parallel to Central Avenue, like Franklin and Washington, doing 60-degree back-in angled parking on Franklin from John to William, let's say? I mean, you'd more than double the amount of parking, slow down the speed, perhaps, school zone speed bumps, one-way street, you're talking a cheap alternative uh, that increases parking and increases safety. You know, so I think that should be considered regardless, you know. Um, and then also another problem we have is the sidewalks themselves. I, I don't know if you hit it in, in here, but Franklin Avenue, you can't put a stroll, push a stroller down it uh, between John and Henry. Um, and they're not wide enough. You know, if we want to increase uh, outdoor eating and stuff like that, you need room to set up tables for restaurants and also push a stroller down the street, you know. So I don't know if that was in there or not, but, you know, just a couple of things. And uh, that's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sir, I pointed at you and, and then, uh, then you, ma'am. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. 
it's, it's not that serious. Or, you know. <laughs> My name is Angelo Raffa, R-A-F-F-A. -A. I'm a 35-year uh, resident of Pearl River. I'm a 28-year owner of a home in Pearl River. I'm less than a quarter mile from the train station, and I've been on the Chamber of Commerce for 17 years now. And I've been part of revitalization for the last 17 years. Um, just in general, I approve of the concept of all of this. I'm glad it's come to fruition. I'm glad that we're talking about it. I was aware of the 203, uh, 2003 plans. This is not much different, but uh, it's moving forward and that's all we can do. So um, as a chamber member over the years, I'm in charge of lights Poles, um, beautification. I worked with Joanne De Lorenzo on the trees downtown, and uh, we replaced the pear trees with large maple trees. And the concept of this downtown is kind of claustrophobic by the showing of the buildings. Yes, they are three stories. Yes, we have a wide berth on Central, we don't have wide berths on the side street. Um, I was hoping that uh, for the buildings along Central Avenue, uh, there would be a first floor, um, I should say second floor and third floor setback so the actual trees can grow large. There would be balconies for Central Avenue and they would uh, keep the broad spectrum of light for downtown Pearl River. Um, the trees were chosen for their ability to grow 30, 40, 50 feet. So in the future, the facades of downtown, we kind of solved that problem by having the trees cover up everything. So um, the trees eventually would uh, be large and boisterous like the trees along Central Avenue field, the sycamores. And um, I'm happy to say that the trees they chose uh, along Central Avenue were all different varieties. So if we get blight in the future and have to start all over again, which we will no matter what. Um, my vision of downtown Pearl River, I do enjoy the plans. I do enjoy the concept. I, my history uh, in 1985, me, my brother, and uh, his friend lived over the uh, Depot Deli across from the train station. So I know what it's like to live downtown. Um, it was great. We had a laundromat. We walked on the streets. Uh, uh, during a snowstorm, we ran up the Sitzmark and rented cross-country skis and skied downtown Pearl River. Um, we used to meet uh, nice people on the sidewalks. This wonderful old lady um, was uh, living next door. She was great. Uh, I was kind of uh, naive back then because uh, the wonderful old man and the wonderful old lady were the same person living next door. They used to, it used to be a dumping site for the Rockland Psych people. And we want to uh, uh, change that so it's a site for people who want to live downtown Pearl River. Um, the train station is one of the reasons why I picked Pearl River. I grew up in Scarsdale, East Chester border. My paper route was Garth Road. Uh, uh, West Chester had many, many downtowns. Uh, there's not many downtowns in Rockland with a train station. So, uh, so we have that going for us and I'm hoping we can build on that. Uh, the zoning has been incorrect for years because 
That hasn't been their freight line since the 50s, I think. That's why there's two fire departments, one on either side of the track. Um, I'm looking uh, to be quiet and talk at the next meeting. We'll have Thank more you. time to talk, don't worry. Oh, I forgot to thank my speech today. <laughs> um, one, yes, ma'am, yeah, you can come up, yeah. I just wanted, while you're walking, the question was asked about New Jersey Transit. We, that's one of the agencies that will be noticed in the course of this to get their input as to what they will do, just like planning departments and such. Again, I, I said this at the beginning, but they have said to me repeatedly, Metro North and New Jersey Transit, you, we will increase service if there's more riders. We will not increase service in anticipation of new riders. So I imagine that's what the writing, in writing comments will be, but we haven't gotten that yet. We're just starting off. No adjacent groups have been notified except the residents of Pearl River. They, they New Jersey Transit is not the most honest. And, no, yeah, not. That's true. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Tina Traster, I'm the editor of Rockland County Business Journal, um, Valley Cottage. I just wanted to be clear about a couple of numbers. Um, in the demarcated area, what is the total number of residential units that's allowed? And with the, zone, with the proposed zone change, what is the number of total residential units allowed? So existing, existing and, and what would be in the proposed zone change. Greatest possibility. Excuse me? Existing and greatest possibility. Well, existing and the maximum allowable. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Once you've done go through all the questions, we'll go through all the, the answers, yeah. Oh, okay. And then, you know, I've covered the, um, the Clarkstown TOD, the Nanua TOD, um, pretty extensively. And um, their intention there is essentially to try to eradicate the um, industrial part of that TOD and try to replace it. And... Um, there's definitely a sense in, in Nanuet that most of those building owners are only too happy to unload uh, their buildings. I think there's a, there are a couple who are holdouts. What is your intention here with, uh, I know you have a lot of industrial um, users down there. Um, I bought tiles from one of them 15 years ago. Um, so the question is what, what will happen with the industrial portion and um, how much does that concern you if you can't transform that? And just another sub, sub question to that is, is the town doing anything to incentivize industrial tenants or, or land, uh, build, no, building owners, he was shaking his head, um, to relocate anywhere else in Pearl River or Orange Town or the county? Those are my questions. Okay, thank you. So we'll touch on those. So the, the first thing, existing versus allowed. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I believe they're in the background documentation on the website, but if not, we will certainly send them out in the future hearings. I think the total units, including single family, multi-bedroom beyond one and twos and such is around 150-ish in the downtown district as shown here right now. And if tomorrow someone were to bulldoze the entire thing and put in everything authorized by the density, it would be in the 400s total. So we're talking about a net of in the three upper threes difference. Uh, uh, well, now you go from like 150 to upper fours. I think it's like 460 total or something. I have to, I, again, I don't have that in front of me. Probably should have, but I apologize. That said, to be clear, the infill development, to your next question, the industrial concept, this area here is industrial right now, except for the strip along Central, where you have the bars and a couple of restaurants and shops. But that's all industrial, and this is all industrial. Um, there's a dual purpose with this zone, theoretically, in that one, it's, so it's a hybrid TOD. You have already a mixed-use corridor along Central in this area here, where you have apartments and commercial mixed together, but the zoning doesn't, as was just mentioned, doesn't actually reflect that. There's you, So you have one guy next to you, can't put apartments in above his building. The one guy next to him has the, had them since 1888 or since 1922. And he can't do anything to them, and the other guy can't build them. It doesn't make any sense. So there's two goals here. One, to standardize a mixed-use concept across the area that has it already. Encourage any future development to be in smaller apartments that are not going to be high bedroom count things so that people are using the type of people that will be using downtown services and amenities. And then two, 
The industrial area would be the infill area. We're talking probably a net of about 150 to 200 units, maybe somewhere in there. Depends on how big you're talking. I don't think anyone's going to knock down the saloon, for example. So you would really figure out what they ended up doing. Um, the issue here that we have is that these larger lots are owned by people who, you know, have owned them for a while, and they are only have so many uses that they can do in terms of value. Someone comes in to buy them right now, they're not as valuable as they could be under the other version. So some humans sell property, you know, and the, we can't control who they sell it to. So if you zone it in such a way that encourages the type of use that's beneficial to the downtown, that brings people that are going to use the school districts when they move from the downtown to then a single family home as they get as their kids grow, kids that people are going to use the train to commute to the city and hopefully New Jersey Transit will then do what they said and encourage it because I mean they'll make more money, right? So they would want to have more trains at the time. You end up with these people that will want to sell so they have cash in their retirement selling to someone who wants to put in what we want there as opposed to someone who's just going to run it like a garbage industrial property. I mean, right now back here, we have a lot of great businesses that do rent space here, but it is just in the end storage lots for different companies that are is really close to a downtown for no real reason. So the idea is increase the value of the property a bit, encourage com someone to come in that would actually do something that benefits more of a cohesive downtown, and then over here to just standardize the concept of apartments over commercial that we have already. And that's why we stopped at John and we told the, the consultant, don't go any further north of that because this is all, that's where it stops being that. Right at, right, at, right at John, it stops being that type of housing. So that explains, I think, those questions. Next person who had any commentary? Yes, in the gap shirt. My name is Patty Pogewhite. I live in um, Pearl River. I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So that LIO, if I'm looking at this map correctly, is that the Harris property? Harris. Harris, that, where it used to be you, Bill Harris's property? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that was the So one. that's Railroad Avenue. Yeah, so this is Railroad right here. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that Harris goes all the way back there. My question is what I'm trying to get to. That lot where that man knocked down all those trees. That's up there. Yep. Right and there. they're still empty. He hasn't done anything but knock I down I can explain that, why that's the case, but go okay. on. Okay, well, let me just, so this zoning issue is not going any further than the end of what I'm looking at as the Harris property? Yes. Okay, so where, where you put your just green pointer where it's white? Yes. Okay. Isn't that where all the trees are knocked down? Yes. yes, and if you have any other questions, we'll get to that when you're, if, if you have any other questions. I, I just try, I don't want to try to interrupt in the middles because that's when well, it gets to Well, he's not, I mean, I thought that was going to be a storage facility. It is, yes. And it's still going to be a storage facility? All right, because it's a, it's a confusing point. <laughs> I, I'm just trying the to The hillside wonder. property here. Uh, well, let her, are you? Yeah, she wants to explain. Uh, if you have, a, I think it's key to, for everyone here, everyone seems to be doing the confused nod thing. Um, that was and is still approved for a storage thing. This is light industrial zone. That's why they got that thing after a big fight. They cut the trees down, started construction. They stopped construction because there was a lawsuit from the neighbors that was continuing, and they were putting, putting hold on putting more money in the property. That lawsuit was just settled with the neighbors literally last week, and they just came into the building department to reactivate their building permits. So this storage unit is still going to stay, the, sto the self-storage that it was going approved for, and the zone doesn't go all the way up that far. That is kind of a far walk all the way up here anyway from the train station. But so you said it's industrial, so the storage area is considered industrial. It's, that stays the way it is. They're putting in a self-storage there already. This area also is similarly zoned to this property, so we are stopping that sort of thing from occurring basically by changing to this zone, if that makes sense. But okay. this is not in the zone, but they are still building it. They just paused it because of the lawsuit, and they're just now restarting it. So go I on with the other I thought maybe they paused it because they knew this was coming. No, and no, that no, maybe no. some no, they, zoning they would not. be changed. Nope. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Next. Yes. Uh, Mike. Uh, good evening, Supervisor Day, members of the council. Michael Mandela, resident of Pearl River for 37 years, homeowner, downtown area, right off of Cherry Brook Park. Just a couple of uh, comments and questions. Uh, one of the things you talked about in the uh, TOD MU3 and uh, T2 
TOD uh, OR threes uh, at 45 feet height of a building, but if they put parking on the first floor, it's another 10 feet. That's 55 feet, which I think is totally, totally too large for the uh, downtown area. There's no reason for another 10 feet for parking. You don't need more than a regular story to park cars, as you see in Manhattan quite often in other places. Uh, number two, uh, we talk about uh, outdoor dining as one of the permitted areas down there, and we should be setting uh, some sort of distance, at least 100 to 150 feet from any residential area, nothing closer than that, because it, it will have an effect upon the, uh, the residents with noise. And uh, there should be something in there that requires, if you're gonna have outdoor dining, some sort of uh, noise abatement, right? That is currently uh, being tried out in town now, but there should be noise abatement that permits the, uh, prevents the noise from the uh, outdoor dining going into the residential areas. Uh, the new construction, any parking on grade, should be in the rear of the building, or if it's underneath, as you said, a facade built up. I think the 80-20 uh, breakdown between the uh, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom is not that bad. It shouldn't add too many students to the district, which we're not looking for. Projections for the next, I think, 10 years in the district are stable, and we're not looking for any more children in the area. Uh, well, you might be, but I'm not, and I don't want to pay the taxes. My school taxes are high enough now. Uh, I don't want to be like South Orange Town. Uh, there's enough older buildings for people to buy, houses to be renovated. I have three on my block, renovated by new couples, two of which just have babies. So there's more than enough ample thing. Uh, we talk about the number of apartments. You're going from 150 to possibly 400 residential units. I think that's too many. I think we could wind up with vacant apartments, uh, and vacant apartments could bring Section 8 money in, which we're not looking for in the town. Uh, so we should, I think, limit the number of apartments in the area uh, and the number of two-story buildings should be limited too. I think we should have some sort of protection for the industrial area. I mean, it, we don't want to lose all the industrial area. It is part of the, uh, the breakdown uh, between uh, homestead and non-homestead, which could affect our overall taxes. So that's just a couple of comments I have now as we go on. More people bring up uh, different uh, things and I think uh, you know, these are some of the ideas that I have that I hope be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Just to that last point, the, um, the anything under this plan would still be non-homestead, that is non-residential. They're all rental apartments, which are classified as commercial. So the industrial property's value will go up and still stay on the commercial side of the tax equation, which pulls taxes away from the, the single family homeowners. Um, there was one other thing you mentioned, but I will... Oh, we do have, there are some rules in the actual code about the outdoor dining, but there's, there was one there, I think the distance was a good one to add to. Um, anyone else? Yes, sir, in the back. Tom Kleiner, Spark Hill, former Irishman supervisor candidate for that position. Um, just a, a couple of quick observations and a question. The uh, project, I think, is, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's really helpful to me, certainly, I'm sure, to the board to hear the comments from uh, the audience because there's a lot of complexity to this uh, proposal. And it's admirable, I think, just in my view, uh, that this project has been undertaken to try to get uh, Pearl River continue to be revitalized, uh, to try to ensure that um, the downtown is successful, and, and as has been mentioned, as an ancillary benefit, hopefully New Jersey Transit, if this does go through in some shape or form, will be able to finally improve train service. Um, when we did the 2003 comprehensive plan, as was mentioned, um, and also when we were redeveloping the Rockland Psychiatric Center property, um, following up on something that Supervisor Day said earlier tonight, the school district, the Pearl River School District, was extremely concerned about increased um, children in the district and the impact on taxes. So from, uh, particularly for, with regard to the Rockland Psychiatric Center redevelopment, the reason why uh, I and the 
uh, town board over the years of its redevelopment never considered anything other than over 55 senior housing was because the district was very concerned. I mean, the joke was the Pearl School District wants anything other than kids because they were concerned about the impact of additional school children at uh, any uh, Rockland Psychiatric Center surplus property redevelopment, and that's why we never uh, considered it at any time. But, but you mentioned, uh, Chris, earlier that, um, that it would not have, uh, even if it did have an impact on the district, uh, it would not have a big impact because the, you know, the population has, has uh, decreased. So I was just wondering if the school district has weighed in yet, and uh, if not, at what point in the process uh, and uh, what you anticipate they might uh, say, or are you just going to wait for them to respond? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, when, when you were considering putting housing in RPC, there was a little different back then, but um, Right now, basically, the structure is such that if you're going to put in single family, single apartments, single bedroom apartments, you're not going to have that many kids. And we have not circulated to anyone except for River residents. Everything is being just talked about. talked about right now, right? So I will say from conversations offline with the, the two superintendents we meet periodically, generally speaking, these sort of things don't add many kids. And if a few kids ended up netting in, it's not a big deal because of the, 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 the amount of usage that's going on in Pearl River. Naturally, a one bedroom can only fit so many kids. We're designing it that way. You don't. You want to allow young people to live. That's the whole point, right? And it's not limited to 55 and up. 55 and up, I'm sure, will still want to live there because it's going to be a downtown, you know, apartment that you don't take care of a yard anymore. But you're encouraging young folks to live there, start off life there, and then be able to move to a single family home locally instead of leading them off to the Jersey Transit tracks along the south, going further south from Hoboken up through. Through piranhas, we're bleeding kids south locally. Forget south, south, south. You know, we're we're bleeding them out locally. So that's the intent to give a place. Guy moves in, girl moves in, meet a, meet someone, move in together in the same apartment, stay local with their parents. They can have Sunday dinner, and then when they have a kid, there's a toddler. They can have they have an extra bedroom maybe, or they could put the kid in the bedroom with them, and then they find a home and they've saved up enough money. They're 33, 34 years old, and they could finally afford that half a million dollar single family home. That's kind of the entry price in this area, right? So, or they can afford to fix a home that's four hundred thousand dollars and make it livable. So we are. That's the goal is to fill that gap in the housing. And that's hopefully what we'll be able to figure something out towards that. So, uh, anyone else who would like to speak tonight, and the first of many meetings? Uh, yes, your hand was up first in the back there, sir. Oh, ma'am, you can go and then. No, go ahead. You're up. You're, you, you, assertiveness is important. You'll be next, sir. Sorry. Uh, my name is Joanne DiLorenzo. I'm from Pearl River. Uh, just a very quick statement. Um, I think uh, you need to consider the overhead wires now. Maybe do that infrastructure first. Um, because if you're building higher buildings, you're just going to have more wires overhead. So, um, you know, the chamber, I know, has been working on those wires, Angelo, for a long time. So they've got to go underground. It's time. Yes. Thank you. And, and the current zone requires that if you're going to put these apartments in, you would have to bury the lines. Uh, that's what the is written would be. So when someone does the changes, they have to bury the lines. Yes, sir, you were next, and then ma'am, you can go. Hi, my name is James Goldsack. I'm a Pearl River resident. I live on Ridge Street. I did receive a letter, luckily. Um, I, I would like to say first that the pictures you've shown, I think, are beautiful. I'd be proud to live in a town that, that looked that way. Uh, my question and concern is about the, the peach colored area on the pinkish peaches, peaches color area on the map. For everyone, these areas? Yes. Um, right now, there are single family residences in the area, and I was hoping you would speak a little bit more about what you're proposing in that section because to me, any change in zoning in that area would greatly um, change the way the neighborhood looks. Is that, do you have any other questions? Or no, that was, okay. that was my Thank question. Thank you. Again, just to go over this again here, this peach color is the same level of development in terms of height and units as the purple area, different uses. So you have office and bank type commercial uses, and then you have downtown traditional business district, bars, restaurants, that sort of thing, shopping in the purple. This is one story of commercial with two stories of residential. And again, the exact scope and the lines and everything is all up for discussion. But 
there are certain properties here that are built up already to fill up the whole lots and certain properties that are more single family. You can see, I'm gonna look at mine because I could read a little better. Uh, so it doesn't go very far down these streets. We're talking just a little bit down William, cuts across a lot there, and then over to Madison and you end up at Madison being kind of the southern border. So you, there are a few single family homes mixed into this area here, but it's mostly non-single family use in this general vicinity. There, no, there are, I know, there are, but it, it, it's, there's a few of this, in this area here, there's a few, but then over here you got a mix, an alternating sort of thing where there's a couple that are split, a couple that are commercial. And Ridge is, this is Ridge, right? Right, so Ridge has, has, has Right, so a portion of, of the one sec this one section of Ridge is the only section, right, and, and I'm, try I'm trying to get through it, man, I'm sorry, but it, it does go through the middle of the street, and this is single family here, and this is mostly, in, mostly uh, you got the CC zone ends here. These green lines, I didn't explain this, I should, probably should have. The green lines are the current zones. So this CC zone, this green line, is a commercial zone that goes along the back edge here, okay? This edge here, yes, there's some, it's, some of it's zoned for residential, but some of it's pre-existing, not conforming. And then this, so this here is where the extra lot line or the zone line for the other non-residential zone ends here. Now, is there adjustment that could be made where this little strip here gets bumped back and you don't have that? Absolutely. That's certainly a change we can talk about. The trying to make sure that we just keep it along the current zoning line, totally an option, um, instead of going on the street line. And we will continue to talk about it, and that'd be a if, if people in that area feel that strong that they wanna keep that sh little strip as what it is, we're gonna look closely at what each lot currently is and look at what it could be and see if we can adjust the lines a little bit. We could always adjust making, if someone comes in and says, hey, uh, if people come in, that this little square here, I don't want that to be peach, and everyone else is like, yeah, and we don't want that peach either, then let it be peach, you know? We're talking about it. So, yes, it's a ridge, this section of ridge, and ridge continues all the way around here. This section of ridge here is the only part on ridge that is affected by the actual zone change. The other, it already abuts the commercial zone as is, although some of the uses are different from the zone. And that's another thing to remember, some of these areas, you have a use, that's been like that for years, but isn't exactly what the zone is, which means someone could go in and do something different already than what you're used to being next to. It's just pre-existing non-conforming uses. Um, so anyone else who has comment or questions or things? Yes, ma'am, I said you were gonna be able to go. Hello, my name is Mary Gaudet. I live on 50 Railroad Avenue. Um, I've been living here for 10 years with my young family and I live just opposite the yellow zone. Right yep, there. right there. Okay. Um, opposite the Harris, the Harris site. Um, just one point made up of two that was mentioned earlier. The type of population that would be moving into the units and the affordability of the units. And this inevitably will bring me to a point that was mentioned right at the beginning of the discussion which is the bars. Um, since I live very close to the downtown area and to the bars and to the saloon, um, and the Orangetown police has heard me on many nights calling them to tell them that there's someone drunk outside my house or someone sleeping on the railroad track or young people fighting on the railroad track. Um, it is inevitable that the young population will find its way to the bars unless this is truly a young professional, well-off population that will be able to afford these apartments. So I don't know how something like this can be um, anticipated, um, but it is, at the end of the day, it is a very real point for people living in that area. Um, and, uh, also, as someone who lives opposite the industrial site, um, I am very happy to hear that a town um, would want to rid itself 
of as much industry as possible so that the residents, even the residents on Railroad Avenue, and we are residents, with families and young children, um, that we would have a humane existence, not one opposite an industrial site. And this was something that was dealt with during the Analitech discussions and as well as the hillside discussions. We want greenery. We want a truly residential town um, where there isn't the kind of noise coming from auto shops and, and uh, metal shops and so on and so forth. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, There's another one. Yeah. yeah. Who was it that had their hand up? I saw. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, sorry. So, um, what was the first sure, question? Well, I'm just saying, I mean, you can intend anyone yeah, to Yeah, oh, that here. was it, the intention. But, yeah. I, yeah. you know, it's going to be based on the market. what the market is. So, there's no way to guarantee these are going to be professionals. This could be 24 year olds going to the bars at night. I mean, that, that, I'm just being honest. There's, there's, you can change the zone, and the, if the developer develops it and he can't get the person that he wants to get in there, he's going to rent it to whoever he can get in there. Yeah, and as far as incentivizing the Harris, I mean, Harris makes a sizable profit on that property right now. He doesn't owe any money on it. And one of the things that people have to realize is we have these great pictures, but these are all individually owned properties where these owners have owned them for, for years and years and years, and they don't own mortgages on these properties. They just pay taxes. So they're going to have to spend a lot of money to do what we're showing tonight. And the, they're going to have to do an analysis. Does it make sense for me to put this kind of money in this development, or am I better off just keeping what I have and being guaranteed the rate of return that I'm used to? And that's one of the things that I've been going back and forth on it. I mean, when we did the sidewalks in Pearl River, the town paid for most of it, but the property owners, any property owners here from the, most of the property owners wouldn't do the 10 feet in front of their building, even though we had tied it in. So we can Give present this, but there's one property owner out of every property owner on Maine and East Central. So they're not here. I don't know if they're going to be interested in it. Some will, but some guys are making so much money, and I'm not trying to rain on anyone's par parade, but I'm just tr trying to be realistic that we don't know who's going to go in there. We don't know who's going to buy into this concept. We don't, I don't know if it's the best concept for Pearl River. I've lived there for 47 years. I have a business on South Main Street. Mr. O'Brien's right. Parking at 3 o'clock is ridiculous. Um, we haven't solved the problem, and by allowing people to pay $15,000 to get parking spots, that's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to make it worse. You're going to put more cars on the street, and uh, you know they, they, they did the zone change for the Joyce, uh, the Joyce Realty Building, and they allowed them to buy. Uh, I voted against it because we haven't dealt with parking, and but by allowing people to, to buy off off site, I don't think that that effectively deals with it. You're just going to create a huge problem, and you know I'm going to try to remain, you know, a and listen to what people have to say, but I'm not sold by this, pro uh, this, this TOD by any means right now. I think that one of the things Tom touched on is a potential negative is actually a potential positive in that people are concerned about rapid change and things flipping real quickly as something different. The reality is that what we're doing, if we were to do this, is to set a condition by which over a period of a long period of time, decades really, it could shift in a direction. So the only places where you would see it be more sudden is right in the industrial areas if someone were to come in and want to do that. And one of the things we're doing is reaching out to well-known and reputable TOD builders to see what they think about the plan so we can sort of see are we being realistic. And, but you're not going to see suddenly every building facade on Central Avenue or every building next to Central over here become the style we're talking about. We're talking about a generational shift to make sure the direction goes in a certain way as changes occur, as people say it's worth investing or not. The only place you'd see it is that if someone's going to buy this one single lot that's this big, yeah, of course, it's going to be planned out at one time and do it when they choose to. But if they don't, they don't. 
and, and, and it is market rate, it is a free market. We can't control who lives there. All we can do is set the conditions by which we're guiding the architecture. We can't control if someone right now were to put a factory in the middle here, it's LI. They could put a, an, a, 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 a loof right here, dead center of downtown, because it's zoned, zoned LI. We can't control those things. We can only guide it in the right direction for a downtown overall. When it comes to the parking, generally speaking, the area here we require on-site parking in the current plan. The area here where it's physically impossible to add on-site parking, it requires one-time contributions for town boards to then store and save for, for acquiring additional property for parking. You got some vacant lots in this area here that currently are literally just truck parking for private property. You walk by it and it's just kind of nothing that, the that future town boards, if needed, could do. Speaking to, you know, I have not lived in the town for 47 years. I've not been lived in this earth for 47 years, but <laughs> my, my wife has worked in the downtown for some time now and in, in, that, in the, the, the former theater building at, at the makeup studio. And I'll say that whatever time of the day I stopped by when she was doing makeup, I've been able to park within a half block of her, of her, of her, of her studio. I mean, we have things to change in the parking forever and we have to adapt in town boards in the future. Whether this occurs or not, are gonna to have to continue to stay on top of things. But the key in my mind is ensuring that the areas where you would see a substantial change, remember there are apartments in this area already, areas with a substantial change, which would be these yet darker yellow and purple areas, must have on-site parking. No ifs, ands, or buts. And it's a question of how much per unit, not whether or not they should have it. These ones, you know, there's a row of apartments here, a row of apartments here, and also, by the way, we, we don't even sell permits. We have zero permits from, the, from that deal with that apartment that went in for the, the senior housing when the anticipation was there would be a whole bunch that were required. They don't take advantage of it. So the, the point is that we, parking is important for the new stuff. Parking is important for the existing stuff. And we have to realize that all these changes, especially this area here, is a generational shift what direction we want it in. And all we can do, and Tom is absolutely right, all we can do is set the groundwork and hope we do a good job of it because someone set a groundwork pretty well for a commercial, sh a commercial or an industrial train line. They put industrial right next to an industrial train line. And then someone, after it was changed to a residential, a, a commuter line, didn't take a cue and shift the zoning from industrial to something residential. They left it as industrial next to a commuter line. Someone decades ago didn't do that. And now, do we want to have industrial on a commuter line, well, we'll figure that out, I guess. So there's a lot of things to work out for everyone here, but those are some good points, I think. But, um, and, and just Paul, yeah. make sure that it's very clear that the biggest lots, the, the orange color and the purple, have to have, they cannot buy spots. No, they're they have not to have under the current proposal, everything dark, Enough spots dark for every apartment. So it has to be underneath parking. Uh, they, they can't have on-street parking. They can't buy spots. It's only for the pinkish color, I guess it would be, or peach color, um, that because of the size of lots, they wouldn't be able to ever do it. So they may have to buy on-street parking or, or pay that, that fee if they can't put the parking on their own thing. So that cuts the number of down. Uh, the majority of these proposed possible yeah most would be in this area or in that area the net increase the most net increase in right and I, i'll also add it was brought up by one resident a couple actually especially by the library about people over parking and then some people over here about the parking on the other side and walking and, and leaving their cars for a long time you know, I'm, we have, we deal constantly with people who don't follow the rules for parking in pearl river the, the lots oftentimes sit empty while people will park and overstay the meters in other areas and we have right now three part-time is it now or is it two four two. who's it no we added another one it's three now yeah it's i forgot if it was three to four but it's the two three part-time parking enforcement agents and any increased fees for parking we have to increase enforcement for parking and make sure that people are not overstaying please call the police department in the non-emergency line if people are constantly doing it because they go by complaints is really what they do. And they do enforce it, they do go out, but people keep breaking the rules with it. So don't give up, it's gonna keep happening. It'll be keep same scoff laws. Ticket prices are low because folks in Prover generally have not wanted to see people get banged up for tickets. So you get a $15 ticket. If the town wants to rate, get people to listen, hit them with a $50 ticket, they'll start listening. But no one wants $50 tickets because they don't want to get hit with a $50 ticket is what it boils down to. 
Anyone else who wants to comment? We're getting, we're only at 10 o'clock. You're only allowed one per session, I'm sorry. But yes, go ahead, ma'am. Anyone who's spoken once here will be able to speak again at future hearings, but generally in public hearings, you're not permitted to per session. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Mindy Bartolotta. I live in Pearl River at the northern end, so I'm part of Nanuet School District. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know if any additional tax income from this project would affect my school taxes. I'm also curious to know, um, are there any, currently, are there any property owners that are even interested in building up? Um, what will attract businesses to come in? Tax incentives or anything else like that? And I, my takeaway is the additional taxable commercial property will be the addition of apartments. Is that correct? And also commercial space, but and yes. commercial, okay. Thank you. The taxes would go to the town government and the Prover School District and the county. The adjoining school districts wouldn't see any tax benefit, but as a resident, you would see a benefit on your town tax bill. Anyone else who would like to speak that hasn't spoken already? Okay. Yes, sir, back. Go. Uh, Robert Breda recently moved to Pearl River less than a year ago. Um, so just a couple things and then two questions. Um, and thanks for tonight and for the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so I recently went through the process of buying a home, so it's pretty difficult nowadays if you're looking to buy a $500,000 home and have a $100,000 you know, cash sitting there. Um, I think there is a solid market for quality people that are looking for a great town to live in. Um, so I think, you know, whereas you look at the downside of things where it could attract negative people, there's definitely a, an opportunity for good people to move into the town. Um, as I plan to be here for the next 30 years or so since I just purchased, um, hopefully raise a family here, if there's opportunity to invest within Pearl River, I'd rather do it here than elsewhere. So that's, that's the point that I wanted to bring up. Um, for questions, so is it only rentals or will it be condos, potential for condos as well? And then the second, the second question would be if this gets rezoned, will it be opportunity to purchase a commercial property that you could maybe transform into half commercial, half residential? and vice versa. Okay, yeah, thank Thanks. you. Um, the, the zone currently would permit apartment rentals, not for purchase condos, specifically to encourage a type of rotation of people that we would want as they move into single family homes. And I get it, man, the half million dollar purchase price really is not fun, but, um, and yeah, right now, if there's a building on Central that's all commercial, that could then be built up a floor or two, depending on where it is, to be mixture of residential and commercial and right by the downtown, by the train station could be just residential from now industrial. It would be then become just residential or commercial and residential. Anyone else who would like to speak tonight, we are gonna reschedule the next hearing so you can all hear when it's gonna be scheduled for if you'd like to come out for that. We'll incorporate some of the ideas from here and some things we've gotten in writing. Anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing none, um, let's look at our calendars if we can. We have, uh, so I'm gonna entertain a motion to schedule, schedule this for a further date down the line. We have, where is, let me just look at the, my public hearing summary. Okay, so we wanna do this probably what, in like a, what do you think? Rob, weigh in, you're the uh, attorney. Well, I'll weigh in. Uh, yeah, let's just, I was gonna so, say, you wanna hear from the board. Yeah. Yeah, I, sure, yeah, of course. One of the points that keeps sticki sticking in my head is dealing with the train service. A and I agree with the gentleman, I think it was Mr. O'Brien who said, if, if we don't get increased service and increased express service, because if you don't have express service, you're going for this, this group that we're trying to bring to this town. If you don't have, you know, two express trains an hour, why would you move? to a transit-oriented development town because you need access to the city. You're, you're going to the city and you're coming back to Pearl River. Uh, that's why we say you won't, use, you won't need a car. So if we can't get uh, you know, the, the train service provider to, to affirmatively give us some, some indication, su indication yeah. then I think it's, it's it, you're going around and chasing your tail because they're basically saying build it and they we will come but you, you got you got now you went building it and you got park ridge and they're still not increasing service 
Right, and they're, they're in the so, process, obviously. So, so. you got to get them to sign off on it before you try to do this, or you're just going to have, I'd say, you know, you're not going to have millennial housing there, I tell you that. You're going to have lower income housing, and you're going to have lower rents, and you're going to have people at the bars. And that's how I see it. If you don't get the train service provider to sign off on this, then you're just chasing your tail. Jerry, you have anything you want to ask? Can I say something? Uh, we're past that point, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. I'll just throw it out anyway. <laughs> Fair. How about talking to congressmen? What kind of, I mean, who cares? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to what we're going to talk to you in a second about I think it's important we maybe circulate this a little bit before the next hearing to get some of this input. Well, I yeah, think, I, I don't I, think you have it too soon. You got to, you got to get. A, what, this is going to be a long process. We don't. This is going to be a long process. We don't have to have a hearing in three weeks. We need to get answers regarding whether they're going to give us some kind of affirmative commitment to this. Right. I, well, know, like, one of the steps we'd have to do is circulate it in order to get that. So what we'll do is, I think logically, if we want, I think. We've gotten a lot of good feedback. I feel like everyone's very engaged and is also, I want to just add, incredibly polite and informative asking questions. And obviously it's the town of friendly people for a reason because this was so awesome the way this went down. Um, and thank you. But I do think that we should consider a circulation of the law as is to get general input or with some minor edits so that for the next hearing, we have feedback from New Jersey Transit, from Metro North, from maybe if not all the adjacent agencies, at least the one that we really care about. And we should vote on that tonight to get that circulation out um, when we set the public hearing. Yeah, yeah, the, all, the, all the appropriate agencies that will be involved. Yeah, I, I somewhat agree with Tom, um, but it's my understanding that this is only the tip of the iceberg. So I mean, if, if you don't, talk about this stuff and you don't come about, you know, it's just not going to change. It's not going to happen. So, you know, um, again, I, I, we didn't come here tonight, at least I didn't anyway, saying that we were going to vote on anything or do anything. Uh, we're just, look, we're we're just looking for public input and ideas. So um, no, we, we, we do reach out to congressmen and go there. But I, I don't think you abandoned it at this point. And I, I don't think, and I, no, I, I'm not saying you did. I said, I'm saying that you know, you don't abandon it at this point, and you, you know, it, it may take one, two, three years. Who knows? You know, we'll see what happens. And it might not ever come. Yeah, and I'd like to start. I still think Pearl River is a great place to live. I just, oh, like yeah. everyone's saying how we got to revitalize Pearl River like we're going down with the Titanic. We still, you put your house on the market. I do a lot of residential clothing. Your house is getting sold within 60 days most of the time if it's price right. So, you know, uh, all this you know, like uh, the sky is falling in Pearl River, I think is a little bit of. Uh, I don't think anyone's saying the sky is but, uh, falling in uh, Pearl River, Tom. I think what people are saying is that it, it, well, we are future. We, the idea, Tom, is not that no one is here doing hysterics. I no one in the residence and no one up here. I don't, I don't think anyone's been hysterical. I think, generally speaking, anyone who reads would know that the re retail generally is going downhill. Look at Clarkstown. You said and tonight, if you don't have a lake that has current, you turn into a swamp. I think that's. It, I think that's what that's what I said generally. Yeah, yeah. the town generally, that's the it. whole con the whole country, especially Rockland County. If you're not growing into the future and planning long term, we just said we're talking a generational change right. as a concept here. Not like oh my God, quick dump things in here. Oh, we got to fix this. It's an emergency. Generationally guided. You know what else could go in right now? Again, you could put a factory in a spot where there's currently the, the industrial right in downtown because no one thought generationally <laughs> ahead. All we're talking about is what general guidance, given long-term macro trends in our country and county, do we want to look at? And th th literally no one here is talking about their, their, their hair, the hair of everyone in Prover being on fire and the place is about to collapse. We're talking about the fact that you do see a high turnover rate in a lot of the commercial establishments in the retail and a low vacancy rate or high vacancy rate on retail or continually things opening and closing because nationally, not Pearl River's fault, it's hard to keep a retail store in business now. So if you have the whole thing that generally speaking everyone in all economists say is people being local to the store makes it more likely to survive. That's all. It's not that Pearl River is collapsing. It's that Pearl River needs to be guided in the right direction so it continues to be thriving for the generations, not so it could be saved from collapse. It's not a collapse, but we're gonna keep it as, good. As someone who works and lives in Pearl River, 
you have businesses coming in. You have AJ's. You have the, the Dinosaur Barbecue. You have the coffee shop just went in. You have businesses coming in here. Ashkenos uh, Chiropractor, he is... Uh, he re renovated that. He's going to have a couple of businesses. My my wife's moving her office there. So there's businesses coming in. There are, yeah. And Tom, no one's saying it's bad. What, what, We're just saying just maybe saying, there's uh, a chance. There's antique shops, yeah. too. I hear yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Antique shops. I'm just saying. And it, 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 Pearl River is, it's not, uh, uh, granted, we're not Ridgewood, uh, but we have businesses that continue to come into town. Matt Reed just opened Cross Country Mortgage. So you have businesses that are coming here. I just think that this is, it, this is going to be a long, drawn-out process. So yes. we That's don't need to have a hearing in four weeks to see what we've done. I think you, you, you go out to like no, the end of November so we yeah, can get some I, comments. That's fine. So That's the, the say, only thing I'd like to say is most 25 to 35-year-olds are moving out of this area yeah. and moving down to Hoboken or Fort Lee or to a transit-oriented area, and they'd really rather be here. And there's no place for them to be here. So to look at a concept and try to go through the process of seeing whether it will work or not is a great idea. No one is saying Pearl River is about I love Pearl River. Everyone here does. That's why we're on the town board, because we want to protect it. But the, there is always an opportunity to make something that's good better. There always is. So and, and, that's all we're trying to do. No one is saying this is a major rush. In fact, I think we started the conversation out saying this is going to be a long process. No one's voting on this for the next eight months, year, maybe longer. It's going to be a long process so that we get everybody's input and make sure we do it right once. Or we don't do it at all. Right. And, and I'll, I, I, do think that, I do think personally that even if it doesn't include a residential component, if everyone suddenly changes their mind and, the whole, and, people, and we get a thousand people pitchforks out about this, that there has to be some sort of rezone because right now you have industrial in the middle of a downtown. Something has to be done about that at minimum to fix it. And if we're, you know, we've got the people who've lived in Pearl River for a long time. As the, as the sole voice of people who this is targeted at on the board, I will say, you know, and I'm, I'm not out of that age group yet, I'm 34, so I have a young family, but you know. So if I had a place like this to live after I got out of the army, this is where I would have moved to because I would have been able to stay in a two bedroom because I, I had a kid young and he wasn't in school yet and I would have been able to be in downtown Pearl River and easily go down to the bars when I wanted to take the train in without having to drive to the train station. And no, it's not the best train commute, but you know what? It's our train commute right now. And yes, we need to circulate it. But the fact is, I liked living in Orangetown and Rockland County. I, that's why I came out of the Army and I wanted to move, move over here. Because, and I had instead to rent a, sing, a small single family home, nowhere near where I wanted to be for a couple of years, because that's what I could find. And it was not fun. It was a long, much longer commute because of that. So. There are, there is a built pent up demand of people who would love to be able to just sort of drive over five minutes away to their parents and have dinner there instead of being down in Hoboken, but that's where they are. And the people that work in Jersey, that commute from Pearl River, that would love to live in these things. We have plenty of time to figure this out. As I said, no one's rushing. No one wants to change Pearl River for what it is. We want to make sure it can stay what it is in, in, a, in the face of changes in the broader county and country and be as close as possible to what we would like it to be in the future, because the future is different. There was a time where Central Avenue was dirt and there were horses on it, and it is adapted well to keep the spirit of the people at that time alive in the modern age, and we have to be seeing in the future, and I'm, for the next couple months I'm here, I'll be helping, trying to help see into the future and guide it in the right direction so that we can make sure, you know, when the future does come, we're ready for it. So I think that Taking into account all the comments here tonight, it's important that we, one, I do agree November would be the right time for the next hearing. Yeah. I got a suggestion. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I'm really more concerned about the process as opposed to yeah, for that's you guys you. in terms of the, uh, the substance of it. But um, just so everybody's aware, and, and I know the board is certainly aware, there's really been a, a team from the town that's been working on this to, to put this together, uh, certainly led by Chris, but uh, um, also with the help of Mazer, who they are here tonight. And they've done a lot of work on it, um, as well as several other, uh, you know, folks in, in the town. What I was thinking, based upon what I'm hearing from the board, is maybe 
putting it over till a November date mm -hmm. for the team. I see Marsha has been taking copious notes. <laughs> Uh, is maybe sitting down and really that's what this was for was to hear what the, the you know uh, citizens had to say either make some tweaks um, maybe reach out to New Jersey Transit Metro North whoever it would be um, without formally sending it around so instead of a formal uh, process we get the change the edits bring it forward prepared to circulate that and in the interim my office can reach out right. to Metro North speak offline to Metro North to maybe get a, a statement uh, you know, from them um, I'm not sure who the bus provider would be, but you know, wh whomever. But maybe do some due diligence in that, and in, in the next month and a half or two months, um, just because we have a few, again coming in here. I, you know, I personally didn't know what necessarily the assistant might say or what the board was thinking. Seems like the board is okay with, and correct me if I'm wrong, at least continuing the conversation. And so in that regard, you know, somebody brought up a good point about Ridge. Maybe take some of those properties out of there. You know. Uh, might be worth a look. So that's something that, again, I'd like to sit down, you know, again, I'm, I'm working with everybody here, sit down with Marsha and say, okay, based upon what we've heard, you know, maybe either shrink it or, you know, make some tweaks and then, you know, again, yeah, speak the, to, to the, me, the bigger thing was uh, uh, the New Jersey Transit. Uh, I'm trying to think of others. We could send it to county planning just to get their input kind of informally, but um, it, that kind of starts the process. We right, yeah, I, we, should, we do I, it right or don't do it. Right. So that. maybe, you kind of internally do what we got to do, circulate to the board, and get some of the answers to the questions that, you know, Tom certainly has raised, and the members of the public. Yeah, we, we got a, a good cross-section of the community, Pearl yeah. River in town tonight, but um, there were enough people, as we heard, that didn't get notice. Yeah, we have to remail For whatever it, reason, so, double -check, so let's make get sure the, the notice out to them, out. give them enough time to come back and, you yeah. know, and listen from there. So, all right, so... I think Rob's suggestions are all good. So what we can do is we can set a public hearing, the, continue this public hearing to, let's call it the 12th of November. Okay. Uh, that is the budget. So we're going to do the 19th of November. There's nothing on the calendar for that one. Yeah. All right. 19th of November at 8 o'clock p.m. So. Yeah. And then we'll, 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 we'll we can just plow through. It's all it's just voting at this point. You want to get it after before we get it done here? Yeah. All right, so we're going to do, and then in the interim, without voting on it, my office will reach out to New Jersey Transit, MTA, Rockland, the Rockland bus people, and does anyone think of any other of the key transportation type agencies? I don't think so, right? Those are the key ones. Well, he did, I did say at the beginning, they're, they, they are earmarking $178 million for increased express trains on the western side and of the Hudson. Not a huge portion of that dollars because they're not building anything, but they're funding more transportation. I want to look in more detail actually at that and see exactly what it includes. The rest goes there, yeah. So I understand, yeah. So the do I have a motion to continue the public hearing to November nineteenth at eight o'clock PM? I'll make a motion. Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Divney, all in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you, and I'll make sure my office reaches out to those agencies. We're going to keep going. We're going to take a motion for a five-minute recess. Five minute recess. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. 8 p.m., yeah. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move us out of recess here. Uh, I don't think technically that's a motion to do that. It ends after five minutes. No, so. I know. We are on item number 14 in your agendas. Item number 14, that is to amend the schedule and the several following resolutions also amend the date times of the hearings on that day accordingly. And again, thank you, Captain Butterworth, for respecting our evening that night by giving us an extra half hour. Is there a motion to amend the town board calendar to bump us up a half hour. I make a motion. Councilman Valentine, second. second by Councilman Dibney, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion to amend the public hearing to 735 for the new code of community choice aggregation. Is there a motion? Aye. Councilman Batari, second by Councilman Dibney, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion to reschedule a public hearing for the uh, unified solar permit to get it to 740 p.m. Is there a motion? Aye. Councilman Dibney, second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor. This is Aye. all on 10-1, all on 10-1. 
Resolution to reschedule a public hearing on a proposed change to the town code regarding lot and bulk controls for PAC developments at 7.45 p.m. Is there a motion? Move. Councilman Divney, seven by Councilman Batari, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Resolution to continue public hearing and to amend that continuation to be at 7.50 p.m. for the proposed zone change for Ryerson Estates. Is there a motion? Move. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Resolution, moving on from that thing to retroactively approve the use of town property for $5,000 for filming. Is there a motion? Move. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Batari, all in favor? Aye. Resolution to retroactively approve Tacomac North Park filming for $5,000. Is there a motion? Yep. Councilman Batari, second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Resolution to authorize funding for the Chamber of Commerce's downtown forever holiday lights, 15K. Is there a motion? Move. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Batari, all in favor. Right. Resolution to approve an addendum to the SRO agreement with South Orange Town. We're on item number 22 now. Is there a motion, Councilman Batari? Second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor. Aye. Resolution to approve me signing a request that's actually a demand for entrance to our property by the DEC. Is there a motion? Move. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor. Aye. Resolution to approve retainer for outside council Keenan Bean. For Article 78 proceeding at Luffy Orangetown. Councilman Batari with a motion, seconded by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to, uh, fi to receive, file, and distribute the budget I just presented. Is there a motion? Move. Councilman Divney, seconded by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Things are happening here, Rob. We're conducting town business. We don't need this, this no. side shatter. Resolution to approve Adler Consulting for Professional Services Left Turn Signal Warrant Study on Tapan Road, Old Tapan Road. Motion. Valentine. Second. Val uh, Batari, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Resolution to approve road use for the Velocity Ride to End Cancer Sunday to October 9th, 6th. 6th. Is there a motion, what Councilman? The Velocity, 2019 Velocity Ride to End Cancer. No, what road is it going to be on? Uh, Jim, do you know what road it's supposed to be on? It just says for road use. Wait, it's in the attachments. Hold on. I got the backup, and that's what's great about this. I can see the backup very easily. Clicking right to it on the PDF. We're looking at attached roadmap. I'm on the same page as you. I'm looking here. Oh, all right, they got a whole. It's going up through Blue Hill. Um, going through Pearl River, so it's going up, up South Pascac, across Crooked Hill, down Maine, across to Washington, down again to Middletown, across the Blue Hill area, and exiting out south by the uh, corporate park area across the What's reservoirs. Is this? this is the, it's gonna be, it's gonna be this is the sixth, was it? Sunday, riders. October 6th. Okay. We're expecting six or 700 riders. All right. All right. Do we, so did we have a motion on that already, or am I? We didn't. Yeah. Motion by Councilman Batari. Second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Resolution to lend assistance for the 2019 American Legion 100th Anniversary Railroad Avenue. Was there a motion? Councilman Batari. Second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Resolution to approve stormwater two education program uh, agreement with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to approve license agreement for Nike Park for the United States Army to do some non-explosives, non-shooting things, just sort of walking and running around training. I make a motion. Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman. Second. Divney, jumped, jumped in there. All in favor? Aye. Terry's a Navy guy. We want to close it. <laughs> Resolution to rescind, resolution number nine, uh, we're, uh, we're rescinding the use of the show and mail. I misread that before. Move. They don't need it, I guess. Councilman uh, Divini with the motion, second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to approve lend aid for the Traubin Fest Sunday, October 6th at the Masonic Fairgrounds. Motion by Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to lend aid for 2019 South Orange Town Day. I'll make a motion. Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari. That is on Saturday, October 19th. 
Resolution to approve use for the Escape New York race, also various roads through the town of Orangetown and the J.B. Clark Rail Trail <coughs> on Sunday, Saturday, September 21st. Is there a motion? Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Move. Dibney. All in you know, favor? Eight mile thing. We got eyes on that? Okay. Just let that post that race again for people walking on that one. Yeah, yeah. We, we make sure that the, the park, the, the rail trail's got a warning sign. Yeah, we'll get... We'll make sure Eric knows to do that. That's important. Uh, 2019 Pro River Day Festival Lend Assistance, October 12th. Is there a motion? No. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Vitari. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to lend assistance for Mr. Carmelo's 50th anniversary, September 28th. Councilman Vitari. Got the Italian sticking together. Second by Councilman <laughs> Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm doing a certificate. I'm going to wear one of the suits he tailored. I might wear the tuxedo. Larry, you, really the tuxedo. I mean, uh, Jerry's zipper is usually in the back. <laughs> I'll let that one go. I'm not going to comment on that one. Resolution to grant permission for Dave Alvarez to attend some various training. Is there a motion? <laughs> Councilman Divney, Seven Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Resolution to grant permission for the same guy to attend other training. Is there a motion? Councilman Batari, second by Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Resolution to adjust the DME's budget line expenses related primarily to the uh, recovery of funds from Yonkers Contracting Company. Is there a motion? Councilman Batari, second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to accept with regret the resignation and retirement of employees under the 2019 uh, retirement incentive. I'm just going to read off the names. Uh, we have uh, Robin Goldsmith of the Assessor's Office. The uh, Stephen Elmendorf of Highway, uh, Helen Chi of Demi, Barbara Dzinski of Town Attorney, Edward McPherson of Building, and Joseph Italiano of Highway. Thank you for your service to the town. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Did, did the person from uh, Pine Canyon go? Robin? Yeah. Yeah, that was the first one I said, yeah. Resolution to approve adjustments in the budget to account for our changes for title search inspections. Is there a motion? Make a motion. Councilman Valentine, second by Councilman Batari. All in favor? Aye. Resolution to appoint Kaylin Morrison to a permanent version of her current job, less than full time. Is there a motion? Councilman Batari, second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. We are now on the audit. They're nice, right? They're surfaces. You know, the NFL uses the surfaces, so I feel like I'm really in the pros here. You guys hear that Eli Manning is no longer the starter? Yes, yes I do. I've got his backup starting this week in fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to go somewhere quick. They need, the Jets need him. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, thanks. Uh, the audit for tonight's meeting consists of four warrants for a total of 895000 The first warrant had one voucher for $62 and was for a toilet rental. <laughs> okay. What happened? So. <laughs> toilet rental. What's so funny about toilet The guy from West Point life. finds humor in toilet rentals. <laughs> so the second Sorry, warrant had one voucher for 109000 and was for insurance renewal. Third warrant had one voucher for $715 and was for data center fees. The fourth warrant had 141 oh, vouchers yes. for 785,000. No. Items of interest: number one, Barry Burners, 47,000 for a new boiler at the building department. Number two, Buyer Ford, 118,000 for police vehicles. That's coming from Rico money. Number four, Capasso, 62,000 for recycling. Number five, GLG Contracting, 33,000 for the Blue Hill Capital Project. Uh, number nine, Munis, or Energov, 47,000 for building software, building department software. And number 12, Virtuit, 12,000 for IT equipment, bonded money. Any okay. questions on the audit? Questions on the audit for Jeffrey? Specifically about the toilet rental, if he has any. <laughs> children, children, I work with children. All right, is there a motion on the audit? Moved on. Councilman Divney, second by Councilman Valentine. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so adjournments. Um, first of all, do we have executive sessions up? 
No. I'm trying to think. Do I? No. They don't have anything. Right? No. no, I don't think it's worth talking. Do you want to talk about that? Playing What's that? Seat? Playing what seat? You know what my Let's wait until Dennis. You want to wait until Dennis for next meeting? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we, might, we, we could try to point at the next meeting. Um, yeah, but we'll just... We can email it. Yeah, just can, yeah you can yeah. email. Email our thoughts. Okay. All right, so we're going to adjourn. Uh, we had a very tragic death recently. Uh, Ariana Joy. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. It's a hard last name. Jotlin, I think it is. Blood or something like that. It's, it's Nordic. Um, she, only age 13. Passed away recently. She's a freshman at Tappan Zee High School. Uh, very suddenly. Uh, so... Uh, Join her family in mourning her death, and uh, and obviously it's very traumatic for any time a child is, is lost that young. So we're gonna adjourn in memory of her. Is there anyone else who passed recently that we um, no, I just, would like to adjourn in memory? You of? know, she um, was my wife's assistant at St. Catherine's CCD for the past four years, and just a, a really really nice young lady, and uh, just had a heart condition that no one was aware of, yeah. and just died suddenly. It's it's really sad. It's a shame. Rick O'Case from the car. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and then we won't do executive session. We will adjourn in memory of Ariana. Is there, I'll move that. Is there a second? Okay. Councilman Valentine, all in favor? Aye. Great, thank you very much.